The first thing we need to know is that Dragon Ball Hakai was created while the manga was in Moro's arch. So this story happens after this arch. Well, the story begins with a narrator telling that Moro was a great evil for Universe 7, but he was defeated and then the universe was in peace until now. We go to a mysterious place, a kind of platform present in the sky of a planet, but something wrong is happening here. A battle is happening and we see a guy being thrown from the sky onto this platform. We find out that who took this blow was a guy named Anzen and from what we saw later on, he seems to be the leader of the Celestial Guardians. Another guy goes to Anzen and that guardian reminds me a lot of Yajoribe. From what they're saying, it seems that a guy attacked the guardians in a well-planned way and caught them off guard and according to this guardian, this guy was making everyone freak out and kill themselves. From what the situation showed us, the guardians were trying to take a little box somewhere and somehow that was very important to the universes but this mysterious guy wanted to stop them for some reason. The guardians didn't have much time to talk because the enemy was coming and then the fat guardian told Anzen to move on and he would delay this guy. As expected, the guardian doesn't make it and dies. And then, when Anzen is about to lock himself in a room that, according to him, the enemy couldn't enter, the guy ends up entering when the door was almost closing. Poor Anzen, he almost did it. Although the enemy is much stronger than him, Anzen seems to be very motivated to put the box he was carrying in a bigger box. And he called this little box the battery box, and the bigger box the ceiling box. And their function, we will understand a little better later. After facing this opponent a little bit, Anzen managed to push him away and get the battery box. But when he was going to put it in the ceiling box, he ended up being hit from behind by the enemy. Guys, the scene was too brutal. The guy simply ripped Anzen's body from behind, took the box from his hands, and then removed, destroying even more his chest and back. It was really gory. Continuing, when Anzen is defeated by this mysterious enemy, he ends up destroying that small battery box. And then, the ceiling box, the big one, releases a kind of light, and four mysterious beings come out of it, which, as the scene has already suggested to us, they were sealed inside. But who are these four? Who is this mysterious enemy that killed the Guardians? Only time will tell us. Continuing with the analysis, the manga cuts to Universe 7's planet of destruction, the Beerus planet. There, Goku and Vegeta are with Wiz, and Beerus is taking a nap as usual. The two Saiyans are in their Super Saiyan blue forms, Goku using the Kaioken, sure, increased 20-fold, and Vegeta using the evolved stage of the blue form. During their fight, we see that Vegeta has a little advantage, and Goku needs to back off. Goku realizes that Vegeta has already discovered his weakness, and then Vegeta reveals that although the evolved blue form and the Super Saiyan blue with Kaioken have the same strength, Goku still has the disadvantage because the use of Kaioken is very exhausting for him. And because of this, he has less durability in the fight. In short, they both start with the same power level, but Goku gets tired much faster by using the Kaioken, and then he gets weaker, while Vegeta manages to maintain his level longer. Well, Goku gets a little more beat up by Vegeta, who tells him to use Ultra Instinct. That's very funny because Goku says he didn't want to use Ultra Instinct because otherwise he would beat Vegeta very easily and it wouldn't be fun. It was hilarious to see Vegeta's angry reaction. To protect his pride, Vegeta insists, ordering Goku to use his true power. So Goku finally uses Ultra Instinct and after that, he asks if Vegeta will use the Hakai in the fight, saying that he was training this technique with Beerus. As expected, Goku quickly ended up with Vegeta in his evolved blue form. But the noise of the Saiyan's combat woke up Beerus, who was very angry and came out to beat Goku and Vegeta. But he ignored Vegeta when he saw him all smashed there on the ground. And at that moment, he and Goku faced each other. And when they were ready to fight, Whis interfered, stopping their blows with his finger. To explain in the meantime, while Goku and Vegeta were fighting, Whis received a communication from the Grand Priest. And the Grand Priest announced that there would be a meeting between the gods and the angels. And the reason for this meeting is a shutdown announcement. And Goku and Vegeta have to go too. This Daishinkan's revelation make Whis quite impressed. And when Whis stopped Goku and Beerus, he talked about his meeting, which completely scared Beerus. Goku, curious, wanted to know what this shutdown announcement was about, and Whis explained that this was a very rare type of meeting where one god of destruction is removed from his position and another is announced, and if Goku and Vegeta were being called, it was because one of them would be the next god of destruction. Like all of us, Goku was completely shocked. Zeno's Palace 
all the angels, gods of destruction, and gods of creation are gathered in the great hall of the almighty Zeno's palace. They were all called there for an important meeting, and they were waiting for the most important participants of that meeting. They arrive, Goku and Vegeta, accompanied by Beerus, Wiz, and Shin. As soon as they arrive, everyone kneels, with the exception of Goku, who greets the supreme deities with total irreverence and is reciprocated by them in the same way. But Goku notes that, unlike the Xenos, the others in that place aren't as happy by his presence, and the Saiyan comments that everyone seems to hate him. Vegeta confirms this suspicion and tells him not to make things worse. Beerus scolds the two, ordering them to shut up before they were reprimanded, and he also orders Goku to kneel, and so the Saiyan does. Daishinkan reveals that it's time to start the subject, and that only the candidates and their master should remain in the center, that is Goku, Vegeta, and Wiz. The Grand Priest sends Beerus and Shin to the side of the others. After doing this, Daishinkan starts saying that everyone already knows the reason for that meeting. That was a shutdown announcement, and at that moment, a god of destruction would be removed from his position, and who would take his place would be one of the mortals, Son Goku or Vegeta Fourth. Goku, again without any reverence, gets up and asks why he and Vegeta were chosen, arguing that there are other persons more capable than them, such as Topo and Jiren. But Daishinkan explains that right now, Goku and Vegeta are the only mortals in the 12 universes who are receiving angel training, and this is a very important requirement to become a god of destruction. He also explains that Jiren, even though he's very powerful, is not being trained by his angel and his god of destruction, and Topo will take Belmont's place in the future, and that's why he wasn't chosen. Goku is very dismayed to hear that. Vegeta, on the other hand, is resigned, saying that he's already accepted the possibility as a condition for training with Wiz, and the Grand Priest is glad to hear that from him. Daishinkan then proceeds with the proceedings by asking Wiz, the master of the two candidates, to state his qualities and competences to assume the position as God of Destruction. Wiz begins to say that Goku is a very powerful warrior and was able to master Ultra Instinct, something that not even the gods of his generation could do. But on the other hand, he doesn't see any other qualities in Goku. The angel claims that his disciple is very absent-minded and is so kind that it comes close to stupidity. In short, with the exception of the fact that Goku is powerful, Wiz doesn't see any other qualities in him to be a God of Destruction. Goku doesn't like this very much, but what can he do? It's true. Now talking about Vegeta, Wiz says he doesn't know Ultra Instinct, but he is learning Hakai and seems promising in learning the technique. The angel also says that, unlike Goku, Vegeta acts with intelligence and seriousness, and he possesses the ferocity necessary to be a god of destruction. Obviously, Vegeta is very proud and brags to Goku that he is better than him. After hearing this report from Wiz, the master of the two candidates, Daishinkan, proceeds by saying that now all the gods and angels must assess everything that has been said and vote on who they think should be the next god of destruction. And after the vote, the great Zeno will give his final decision. The gods and angels gathered to vote, and after a while, Daishinkan already had the result. He announced that all the gods of destruction and angels voted unanimously, and with a score of 24 to 0, the one chosen by the deities was Vegeta. Of course, the prince of the Saiyans teased Goku with this, and although he didn't want to become a god of destruction, he was annoyed by such disproportionate result. Daishinkan, speaking to the Xenos, says that according to the decision of all the gods of destruction and angels, the one who should be chosen as the next god of destruction should be Vegeta. But the Xenos don't care what others say and choose Goku, leaving everyone at that meeting absolutely shocked. Very angry by this one-sided choice of the Xenos, Vegeta is about to protest, but Beerus, fearing an action from the Supreme Deity, scolds the Saiyan. Faced with the threat of the Destroyer, Vegeta gives up talking and kneels down again. Understanding that he would be a god of destruction, Goku is very upset. But with no choice, he just asks which universe he will go to. That question brings the Grand Priest into the second part of that meeting, announcing which God of Destruction will be deposed. He says that among the 12 destroyers, only four of them are doing a satisfactory job, which are those four whose universes didn't participate in the Tournament of Power. Jin from the 12th universe, Liquor of the 8th universe, Arak from the 5th universe, and Iwan from the 1st universe. With the exception of these four, all the gods are at risk of being deposed. That's because the average of their universes have fallen too far, and some have even disobeyed the divine rules acting in their own benefit. Hearing these serious statements from the Grand Priest, the gods are frightened. Daishinkan finally reveals which destroyer will be removed, and the destroyer is 
Champa of the Universe 6. With the Grand Priest's revelation, Champa is apparently saddened, and not only him, but other deities as well, including Beerus. Daishin Ken asks Champa to go to the center and to Fuwa, the Supreme Kai, to join him. When they do this, Daishin Ken says that in addition to Champa's universe having a very low average, showing the neglect of him as a god, he also broke the realm rules by entering Universe 7 without the god's permission to collect the wish orbs. For these reasons, he is being removed from his post. Champa, apparently resigned, says he's been waiting for this, but asks what happens to him now. The father of angels replies that he will now lose his energy of destruction and losing his divinity, he will begin to age again from the moment he became a god. And because he was the ruler of Universe 6, he could choose any planet in that universe to live his life as a mortal. Champa decides to choose Universe 6's planet Earth as his home probably because of the delicious foods on the planet and perhaps because it's a gift from his brother. Fuwa sadly says that he tried to convince Champa to work properly many times, but was always scolded by him. He ends by saying that it is sad to end up like this. Daishin Kan tells Fuwa that because his life to be bound by Champa's energy of destruction, with the loss of the destroyer's divinity, he will inevitably die. Now your destiny is to return to the supreme planet of Universe 6 as a dead god. Like Champa, Fuwa accepts his fate Daishin Kan asks the Xenos to do the procedure, and so they do. With the removal of Champa's deity, a halo appears on Fuwa's head. Champa was no longer a god, and Fuwa was a dead god. This is the fate of the gods of Universe 6. Daishin Kan asks Vados to accompany Champa and Fuwa back to Universe 6. She immediately complies, but not without acting out a false sadness at her former student's fate. And obviously, Champa unmasks his bad acting. When Vados is taking him and Fuwa away, Champa takes one last look at his brother, Beerus. After that, give a last look to his brother too, a discreet display of affection. After that, the Daishin Kan concludes the meeting by saying the preparations for the formation of a new god of destruction takes approximately 24 Earth hours. Until then, all gods are dismissed. He instructs Goku to be on Universe 6's planet of destruction within 24 hours. Until then, he can do whatever he wants. After these closing words of the Grand Priest, all the other gods and angels go away. Only those from Universe 7 are left in the palace. The Xenos waste no time in going to Goku to ask him to play with them, but Goku kindly denies it, saying that he needs to go back to Earth and say goodbye to everyone, and even ventures to say that Bulma will prepare a party for him. Nothing pretentious about this Goku. The Xenos don't care. After all, now that Goku is a god, he'll be able to play with them for a long time, even whole centuries, right? Goku is a little scared with this affirmation and immediately makes an excuse to get out of there. Then they leave. Capsule Corporation. When they arrive at Capsule Corporation, Chi Chi and Bulma are there, relaxing in the garden, and also Goten and Trunks are there having some fun. Goku is startled to see his wife there. When the two women reach them, Bulma is alarmed that they're back so soon this time, and seeing Beerus, Whis, and Shin asks if Earth is in danger again. Beerus answers this question, saying he's there because Goku mentioned a farewell party. Hearing this, Chi Chi asks who is leaving, and Goku decides to tell her the truth, revealing that he will be a god of destruction from another universe. After everyone's shock, Chi Chi faints. As soon as she received the news from Goku, Bulma called an emergency party, calling all of their friends and everyone wanted to better understand what was happening and also to say goodbye to Goku. It was only at night that Chi-Chi finally woke up. Goku immediately justifies himself, saying that he didn't want to be a god, but it was the Xenos who chose him. Bulma asks why he didn't deny it, and he replies that if he had, he could have been killed, or worse, the entire Universe 7 would be destroyed. But to everyone's surprise, Chi-Chi is starting to accept the idea, saying that at least Goku would have a job, and this time, a job that suits him better than being a farmer. Gohan disagrees with his mother, arguing that the work of a god of destruction is too cruel, and he doesn't see Goku doing such things. Beerus agrees with Goku's son, but says he couldn't argue with the decision from the great Zeno. Trunks questions his father if he lost to Goku again, but shuts up when he is threatened with a beating. Bulma asks Goku how he's going to destroy planets if he can't even kill his own enemies. The Saiyan replies that Daishin Kan told him that a god of destruction's job was much more than just destroying things, and that he would see that but he also says that he'll avoid killing people as much as possible. Gohan asks if Goku will work with the Supreme Kai, and he says he doesn't know, because Universe 6's Supreme Kai died when Champa lost his divinity. But Shin reassures him by explaining that Fuwa died because he had his life linked to the Champa's energy of destruction, but when the ritual to make Goku a deity was done, he would also have his life linked to a Supreme Kai. 
Goku, curious, asks how a Supreme Kai is chosen. Shin says that there are a few ways this could happen, but in this case, the Universe 6's Kaiju tree probably bore a golden fruit, which is probably why they've decided to change the God of Destruction just now. Continuing with the interrogation, Vegeta asks what the Kaiju tree is, and Shin explains that he and all Supreme Kais, as well as the King Kais, belong to a race called Shinjin. Shinjins are all born from a divine tree called Kaiju tree. The common fruits of this tree give life to Kingo Kais, while golden fruits, which are much rarer, give life to Supreme Kais. Probably a golden fruit was born on Universe 6's Kaiju tree, which is why they're making this exchange now. Trunks is surprised that Shinjins are born from a tree, and he thinks that's weird. But Wiz argues that it's much better than the way they're born. Such a comment provokes curiosity in Goten. After all, how are we born? Chi Chi is furious with Wiz. She probably hasn't had that conversation with her son yet. The angel apologizes for his inappropriate comment. Goku, still in the conversation about the birth of Shinjins, asks about what happens if a fruit is born rotten. Shin explains that when an ordinary fruit is born rotten, Makayos, corrupted King Kais, are born. And when a golden fruit is born rotten, a Makayoshin, a corrupted Supreme Kai, is born. In all cases, these corrupted gods are sent to the demon realm, and they rule there. Shin further explains that they met a Makayoshin a few years ago. That was Dabura. That is, he and Dabura belong to the same race. They obviously are in shock with this information. Beerus, strangely uncomfortable with this matter, interrupts the conversation, saying it was time for them to go. Ready to say goodbye to her husband, Chi Chi asks if Goku will be able to visit them. Wiz replies explaining that until Goku learns the basics of his role, his universe, and how to control his powers, he won't be able to visit them. But as her sister, Vados, is quite strict in her training, maybe that won't take long to happen, so he can visit them. That's if Beerus doesn't mind, of course. But for the Destroyer, whatever. Goten asks his father if he could go along with him to train. It's Wiz who answers that question too, saying no. Mortals cannot stay long in other universes, except in exceptional cases. But Goku comforts his son by saying that when he does return, he wants Goten to be strong enough for them to train together. Goten, excited, promises his father that he'll get stronger. So Goku ends his family's farewell by asking Gohan to take care of them. The firstborn assures Goku that he will. The next to say goodbye are the members of Goku's martial arts school. Krillin says goodbye, asking Goku never to forget his essence as an earthling. And Master Roshi tells his disciple to show the gods the power of the turtle school. Finally, Vegeta tells Goku that it doesn't matter whether or not he's a god, he'll be the strongest. Goku doubts that. Then the big moment arrives, and Goku leaves with the gods to the other universe, starting his new journey as a god of destruction. Bulma, who was his companion in his first journey, wishes him good luck and says they'll be waiting for him. Everything seems normal on Universe 6's planet of destruction, but there's nothing normal about the day. Someone arrives at high speed on a planet. It's Goku, accompanied by Wiz, Beerus, and the Supreme Kai. The Saiyan comments that place is identical to Beerus's planet, and the god of destruction comments that the god's planet planets are the same, but there isn't much time for them to talk. Vados immediately arrives to greet them. Beerus, wasting no time, asks about the food and has Goku's full approval on this question. But Vados is sorry to say that there's no time for food. It's almost time for the ritual to start, which scares Goku. Inside the castle, walking down a dark corridor, Goku doesn't have a happy expression. Wiz wants to know the reason for such sadness, and Goku reveals the obvious. That place was so depressing, he didn't want to live there. But Vados tries to cheer him up by saying that there are many places to see in the universe, but he will also be busy since Champa left a lot of work accumulated. Also, as a god, he would have many special trainings. The part where it says training really cheers up Goku, which changes his mood. They finally arrive at the place where the ritual would take place, and there are already gathered all the others who will participate. The 12 gods of destruction, the 12 angels, the 12 gods of creation, and of course, the grand priest. Goku is scared that everyone is looking at him so much. Was he late? Vado says, no, they were two minutes early. But these meetings were always very tense. Goku looks for the Xenos, and Beerus says they won't come because they don't like this kind of meeting. The Destroyer agrees with them, but unlike the Supreme Gods, he can't deny his participation. Something catches Goku's attention. He notices three statues in one corner of the room. One of these statues belongs to Champa, and the other two are unknown people. But looking at the costumes, we see that they're all gods of destruction. One of them is a strange lizard man, and the other looks a lot like Tapion, a character from the latest Dragon Ball Z movie. Goku asks who they are, and Bato says they're all all the ancient gods of destruction from Universe 6, and as he can see, Champa is the third. Goku is surprised that the gods was changed so many times. Wiz explains that eventually, the destroyers leave their position. This can happen at their own request, by expulsion, or even by death. 
The last phrase scares Goku, who can't think of anyone killing beings as powerful as the gods of destruction. Beerus explains that in this thing they call existence, there are many powerful beings, and that even though the gods of destruction are very high on that scale, they are still very far from the top. Bottles promises Goku that he will teach him about it in his lessons. But what he needs to know now is that there are three generations of gods of destruction, and he's the first deity of the fourth generation. Goku seems to understand. He says the Topo is being groomed to be Universe 11's new god of destruction, just as he and Vegeta were being groomed to be Universe 7's new gods. Beerus praises Goku's sudden insight, but states that the change of generations can be very slow, and the time of reign from one god to the next can take up to millions of years. Daishinkan announces that the time has finally come to begin the ritual. He has two pillows in front of him, one of them empty, the other with a golden fruit on top. Daishinkan asks Goku to sit on the reserved pillow, and facing that strange fruit, Goku asks what it is. The Grand Priest explains that that fruit will be the new Supreme Kai of the universe, and that once their lives were connected, the Supreme Kai would be born. Goku thinks that he was a little weird, but okay. Daishinkan asks Goku to completely empty his mind, and that it's important to do that. The Saiyan obeys, and then a kind of energy starts to circulate around, and two small energy balls appear, one white, the other purple. Purple energy goes to Goku. After that, he opens his eyes, and he's already dressed as a god of destruction. When he looks to his side, he sees a Supreme Kai standing there. He says he didn't see her, and she says why. His eyes was closed. Goku takes a good look at Supreme Kai and reveals not knowing that these beings can be born female. She explains that Supreme Kais are genderless, but that they can be born with a female appearance. After explaining this, she introduces herself. Her name is Liai. Goku responds by saying his name as well. Daishin Ken says that they better get along very well, for from now on, their lives are connected, and they must work in harmony for the good of the universe. Goku changes the subject by asking Daishinkan if the ritual went well. That's because he didn't feel any different, but the angel says that yes, everything was fine, but that he will only feel the changes in his body gradually. But he has stopped aging, meaning he is now a deity. Bottles, playful as ever, says that Goku looked better in that costume than Champa, and only now does the Saiyan God realize he was no longer wearing his usual clothes. All the deities present in that place approach. Daishin Ken commands all angels to greet the new god of destruction and the goddess of creation, Son Goku and Liai. After that, he tells the new gods that it is now their duty to work for the peace and good of Universe 6. They agree. After that, Daishin Ken ends the meeting. Everyone leaves with the exception of the gods of Universe 7 and Universe 6. Coming to Goku, Wiz, his previous master, asks if he still doesn't feel differences in his body. Goku this time says yes. He feels like there's a strange energy inside of him. Wiz understands and says it's the energy of destruction. Goku doesn't understand very well and asks if the angel refers to Hakai. The answer comes from Vados, who explains that Hakai and the energy of destruction are not the same thing. Both are similar since Hakai is a byproduct of the energy of destruction, but there are differences between these two concepts. But she says he'll learn that later. Goku doesn't understand anything she said, but gets excited anyway. He looks at Beerus and says he's going to train hard so they can have their rematch. Match. Beerus smiles, saying he's barely become a god and is already getting arrogant. He then calls Wiz and Shin to go home, and they go, leaving the gods from this universe alone. Liai is confused. She doesn't know what to do, which is understandable. After all, she was born a few minutes ago. Well, Models explains that, as has been said, Champa and Fuwa didn't do a good job. More Champa's fault, to be fair. Anyway, the new gods now need to prepare to do a good job. Goku will train with her. Meanwhile, Liai must go to her assistant, a god named Kiboru, who has been waiting for her. Kiboru was waiting for the ritual to end to take her, so Liai must go with him. The new Supreme Kai walks up to her assistant and greets him. The assistant does the same. After that, they leave. Now only Goku and Bottles are there. Goku asks if he can wear his usual clothes. He doesn't really like that God of Destruction costume. Bottles replies yes. While on his planet, he can wear whatever suit he wants. The God of Destruction outfit is only mandatory on formal occasions. After changing Goku's clothes, Bottles asks if they can start with activities now. Goku says he's tired. He hasn't been able to rest since he started this whole thing about becoming a God of Destruction. Bottles agrees and asks if she should wake him up in approximately 35 years. Goku freaks out. Would he need to sleep for decades now? Couldn't he just wake up tomorrow? Bottles laughs. She now remembers that sleeping for so long is a characteristic of the Neko Sajans, probably the name of Beerus and Champa's race. Now that she would deal with an waking god every 
day, things would change a lot. Meanwhile, in Universe 7, Beerus is sitting on a tree stump watching his planet's lake. Wiz watches him. He asks if the Destroyer is okay and that he's been there since he got home from the meeting, which is many hours ago. Beerus says he's enjoying the silence and quiet, but Wiz refutes it, saying he doesn't seem to be enjoying it that much. Beerus admits something is bothering him. It's a little too quiet. He must have gotten used to those idiots over there. Wiz agrees that two are really fun, especially Goku, with his goofy, laid-back personality. Speaking of Goku, Beerus asks how Wiz thinks he's gonna deal with this whole God of Destruction thing. He always said he couldn't destroy anything. Wiz says that's a good question. How would Goku handle all the moral dilemmas this role entails? But the angel says he will no longer be the same and asks if that's what worries Beerus. The destroyer smiles. Worried? He? No. He is at most curious. He says he's going to take advantage of the silence to get some sleep and that in a month, Wiz could wake him up to go to Bulma's for something to eat. The angel obviously agrees. Beerus flies out of there, but as he flies, he wonders why he is so concerned about the life of a mere human. Did he care more than he should? The next day, after a long rest, Goku begins his training as a god of destruction. Bottles and Goku are on the planet's field. The Destroyer's master explains that the first step of his training will be to access his Destroyer's energy. Goku asks how he does it. Fado says that there are several stages of controlling this energy and that he will learn this over time. For now, he'll do it in the simplest way, which is to feel the feelings necessary for destruction. Goku doesn't understand this information very well. Does he access the energy of destruction with feelings? Fado explains that when someone is destroying something, it is natural to feel things like anger and other negative feelings. Goku smiles. It would be easy for him. He already feels angry when he transforms into a Super Saiyan. But Vados explains that it's not so simple. His rage cannot be simple. It has to be a specific rage, a desire for pure destruction. He needs to rid his mind of any hesitation. He just needs to want to destroy and nothing else. Goku comments that Vegeta said something similar to him when he told him about his training with Beerus. Vados says the form of training may be the same, but the result won't be. All a mortal can do is simulate the energy of destruction in order to perform Hakai. But this is a limited simulation and it can't compare to the destructive power of a true Hakaishin. Well, even after all this explanation, Goku doesn't understand anything. Bottles gives up the verbal explanation and suggests a practical approach. Goku prefers it that way and says he's going to be very angry. He increases his ki, even causing weather anomalies on the planet, but it's all useless. Bottles tells him to stop. He's not using the energy of destruction, just ordinary ki. Goku is disappointed. He felt all the anger he could feel and it still didn't work. Bottle says that if it wasn't working that way, they had to try another way. Meditation. She says that by doing this, Goku will be able to find the energy of destruction in his body. And if he can do that, he should familiarize himself with it. Goku still doesn't quite understand, but says he'll try while sitting in a meditation pose. Bottle says to the Saiyan God to focus and try to feel all of his ki, as well as his thoughts and feelings. He will find a source of negative energy within himself. Himself, probably in the darkest places of his mind. When he finds this source of energy, he must merge with that energy. But he must be careful, because if his will is weak, the energy will consume him. Goku manages to reach the dark region of his mind, but he thinks that place is too scary, and he had no idea that such a place could exist inside him. Goku closes his eyes and concentrates to find the negative energy, and when he does, he flies towards it. The energy source is a large globe of purple energy, and seeing that, Goku says he gets chills just getting close. Goku touches the energy, and then he starts to feel something bad, and according to him, he never felt so much pain in his life, and he's also feeling a great rage. Goku suddenly remembers his moments with his grandfather and his death, remembers the times Krillin died at the hands of Tambourine and Frieza, and also remembers Miris' death. But the Saiyan says with great determination that that energy will not consume him, it will obey him and give him power. An impact wave makes the planet windy. Bottles wonders if he was successful in his internal journey, but when Goku stands up with a serious expression and forms a small ball of destructive energy in his hand, she wonders if he's been overpowered. Goku exhales an aura of ki, but then disperses that ki along with the energy in his hand. Goku signals to her, it's okay. Vados congratulates the destroyer and says that the first step of his training is complete. Planet Hale is an inhospitable planet with an icy climate where apparently no living being is able to survive for long. On top of a large glacier, a ship lands, which we can identify as Frieza's ship. The ship's gate opens, and who comes out is Frieza, accompanied by his two loyal servants, Kikono and Barry Blue. They walk across the glacier until they come to a rock of ice. Kikono presses a button that is hidden in his rock, 
and it's revealed that it's actually an elevator. They enter the elevator, which takes them inside the glacier. While in the elevator, Frieza comments that it's been a long time since they'd been in that place. Barry Blue agrees and adds, that's the last time King Cold was with them. They went there to lock someone up. Actually, that prison was built to hold that person, and after that, it was no longer necessary for them to go there. When the elevator door opens, they're in a hall inside the glacier, and in that hall are several soldiers from Frieza's army. At first, they're talking casually. However, when they see the Emperor, they are immediately startled and kneel down. Frieza smiles says that there are many soldiers there, but they're all useless. If he woke up, they would all be killed. Barry Blue, in his thoughts, remembers that many years ago, the general of Cold's army was the Great Cooler, Cold's firstborn son and Frieza's older brother. Cooler, as general of Cold's army, won many victories for his father's empire. However, his power was so great that even the king feared him, as Cooler was much more powerful than Cold and Frieza. So, fearing that his eldest son would usurp his throne, Cold, a along with Frieza, betrayed Cooler and imprisoned him and his most trusted soldiers in the prison built especially for him this prison they're in. They arrive in front of a large door and Frieza, pressing a button, opens it. This is the door of a big hall, where in the center, there's a big capsule. Inside that capsule, there's someone in prison. That person is Cooler, and his arms and legs are stuck in metal blocks, and around him, there's a strange liquid. Upon seeing his brother, Frieza praises Kikono, saying that the prison capsule he created is still effective even after many years have passed. Kikono thanks his lord's praise and explains that the liquid inside the capsule contains a powerful which keeps Cooler paralyzed and sleepy, and those blocks that hold Cooler's arms and legs emit a very specific type of radiation that neutralizes Ki. Kikono adds that he worked for months to build that capsule and also spent a lot of resources. Frieza again praises Kikono's work but orders him to empty the capsule. Kikono is surprised by that order and asks if Frieza is sure about that. He says that only the metal blocks might not be enough to keep Cooler under control. Frieza explains that his brother was much more powerful than him and his father in the past. However, since being arrested, Cooler has not increased his powers, but he, Frieza, has gotten much more powerful. His brother was no longer a problem. Kikuna obeys, and when he presses a few buttons on the computer, the capsule begins to pour the sedative liquid, and Cooler reacts immediately. Kikuno is surprised. In a few seconds, he was already starting to react, but Barry Blue wasn't surprised. Could anything less be expected of the great Cooler? Cooler wakes up and then, with great rage, shouts his brother's name, who responds with a sarcastic smile and compliment. Cooler asks how that bastard dared to stand in front of him, and what about Cold? Did he not deserve his father's illustrious presence? But Frieza gives him the news. Cold has been dead for a while. Cooler doesn't like to hear that news. He was the one who should have killed Cold, but the shock was yet to come. Frieza says that, oddly enough, it was a Saiyan who eliminated the king. Cooler says that was impossible. Those monkeys could not kill their father. Frieza explains that a lot has changed since he was imprisoned. In fact, the Saiyans were no longer the weak beings they used to subjugate. And as painful as it may be, there are Saiyans stronger than them. But to Cooler, it was blasphemy. How could Frieza let this happen? Cooler's power increased increasingly awakening began to crack the metal blocks that held him, which scares Kikuno and Barry Blue. But Frieza, with a sad expression, says that unfortunately their army, which once dominated everything they wanted, is now no longer sovereign in the universe. And Frieza says he needs his brother to join him so that together they form a powerful elite of warriors that is capable to defeat the Saiyans who live on Earth. But Cooler thinks that proposal is absurd. Join him? No, he would kill him, and he would kill his servants. And then he himself would go to Earth and kill those Saiyans. Kikuno yells for Frieza to be careful, and then Kulo breaks free of his handcuffs, and the pressure of the prisoner's energy launches Kikuno and Barry Blue out of that room, and also pushes back the soldiers that were in the hallway. Afterwards, Cooler flies to Frieza to land a hit on his younger brother, but is completely shocked when Frieza easily handles his hit with one hand. Frieza says he's very happy that his brother's powers have not decreased by even 1% in all those years, but time has passed, and now Cooler's power is totally surpassed. Frieza starts releasing his energy, knocking Cooler to the ground, completely scared, and then he shows the golden form with a smile, proud of his power. Cooler opens his eyes wide to see that transformation. He is shocked. That form surpassed all his transformations. Frieza agrees, but tells his brother not to be sad. If Cooler joined him, he would teach him that transformation, and he adds that together they will form a powerful elite that will overcome the warriors of planet Earth, and also all gods of the universe. In this way, Frieza's army would once again be sovereign in the universe. 
Cooler, seeing no other option, finally agrees, with the only condition that Frieza also free his special forces, who were also trapped in that prison. Frieza agrees, and the two brothers seal the deal with a handshake. A few minutes later, they finally leave the prison. Frieza, Kikuno, and Barry Blue are now joined by Cooler and Cooler's special forces, the elite troop of the former general of Cold's army. Entering the ship, Cooler notes that it was much more technological than the ships they used in the past, and Frieza says that he must thank Kikuno, who built that wonder. Cooler looks at Kikuno, who fears him very much. Frieza says that the ship was not only beautiful and comfortable, but that it also had very spacious and sturdy special training rooms, and it was also much faster than the old ships, which was perfect for the trips they would take. Cooler observes a creature of the Yadarat race in one place of the ship. He asks who it is, and Frieza says his name is Linzur. Cooler asks why he's there and says he seems to be very weak, but Frieza explains that his abilities will be very useful and he'll see that in the future. Cooler changes the subject and asks what they will do from now on. Frieza goes to a computer and presses a button, then an image of five cocoons appears, and below each cocoon is their names. They are Janemba, Hiru, Hatch, Majin Buu, and Kalimor. Frieza explains that in addition to Cooler, he has selected five other extremely powerful warriors, or rather five super powerful beasts. He states, with these creatures, they will be able to subdue all warriors on Earth, and also all gods of all universes. But Cooler doesn't understand that very well. Gods? Universes? Frieza said strange things. But Frieza assures his brother that he will explain everything in due time. All he needs to know now is that there are beings far more powerful than they are and they've their lives in their hands. But with these beasts, they will be able to defeat these beings. Cooler says that this conversation about gods and universes can wait. He wants to know more about these such powerful beasts. Taking a closer look at Majin Buu's image, Cooler recognizes him. He comments that he's seen that creature somewhere. It's that Majin Buu that millions of years ago destroyed hundreds of civilizations. Many years ago, Cold's army investigated this creature because of the mythology about him that they found in some parts of the universe. Cold, at that time, instructed them not to bother Majin Buu in case they encountered him. The existence of that creature was a taboo. Frieza explains that these beasts are called the five great primal beasts. They are super powerful creatures that are part of a deity sealed away many years ago. He doesn't know the details, but he knows that these creatures can surpass even the gods of destruction. About Majin Buu, from what he found out, a part of his power was released many years ago by a mage named BBD, and it was that part of Majin Buu's power that caused all that destruction they'd heard about. That part of Majin Buu was released again a few years ago, but was defeated by the Saiyans. However, there's still most of Majin Buu's power that has not been unleashed, and it is this part that Frieza intends to use. Cooler is surprised. How can his brother know so much? How does he know about those beings and where to find them? Frieza explains that he learned all of this from a being called Zuno, an omniscient being who lives in their universe. He forced Zuno to reveal all this information. Zuno talked a little too much, wanted to tell everything in detail, so he forced him to summarize the information. And the important thing is that now he knows who the beasts are and where to find them. Frieza points to one of the creatures, Janemba, and says he will be the first they meet. Eager, Cooler tells him to go soon. He's curious to find these primal beasts. A month later, Kikuno and Barry Blue are bored by the trip, but suddenly something alerts them, a massive fissure in space. Kikuno thinks it must be there, but Barry Blue is sure it is. Frieza and Cooler are training in a special room. Cooler is completely exhausted while Frieza is apparently fine. Frieza praises his older brother, saying that in that month of training, he evolved what he would have evolved in two or three months. But Cooler is not surprised. After all, he's the great Cooler. But in his thoughts, Frieza says he'll be watching his brother's evolution, and if for some reason he thinks Cooler might be a threat, he won't hesitate to kill him. Their conversation and Frieza's thoughts are interrupted by Barry Blue, who warns them that they're arriving. Frieza and Cooler go to the main room of the ship, where they see where they're going. Cooler asks what is that place, and why are they going there? Frieza explains it's a fissure in space that will lead them to the Makai world, or Realm of Demons, where they will find the new recruit. Kikuno notices something and looks to Linzer, and he tells the Yadarat that even though that ship is very resistant, it won't withstand the energy emanating from that fissure, and if they get any closer, they will be destroyed. He needs Linzer to teleport them beyond the fissure. Cooler is surprised by this and asks if it's possible to teleport to another dimension. Barry Blue explains it, saying that the Yadarat race is known for having many 
tricks, and one of them is that instant transmission technique. But actually, teleporting to another dimension is quite a task even for this race. But Linzer is a prodigy in this technique, even among his race. Cooler tells Frieza that he now understands why he brought Linzer. It's an insect with interesting tricks. Linzer does his technique, and then the ship instantly goes to Makai World. The demons of that realm, upon seeing the invading ship, will immediately destroy it. But Kikono was prepared for that. So with the press of a button, he creates a force field that protects the ship from the creatures. Frieza says that, according to information given by Zuno, Janemba is in a floating fortress, not far from that fissure. With this super fast ship, they should be there in a few hours, but they must be prepared. They will find resistance. A few hours later, they arrive at the castle, but the building is protected by a force field. But that won't be a problem. Linzer teleports them beyond the force field. When the ship lands, Frieza, Cooler, and Cooler's special forces leave. In the castle courtyard, they find a monster that is guarding the entrance. And as soon as it sees the invaders, the monster roars and runs towards them. Frieza says that this was a good opportunity for Cooler's men to show if they are still worthy of belonging to Frieza's great army. Cooler tells his men not to let him down. The trio of soldiers place themselves in front of their leaders. Captain Salza uses his tracker to measure the monster's power. The number is 250,000, which Salza finds impressive, but he says that together they'll be able to win. The captain orders the soldiers to make battle formation 16, and they agree. Frieza, in his thoughts, reveals that he remembers this old division of Colt's army that surpassed the Ginyu special forces. While Dor is facing the monster, Frieza, in his thoughts, reveals that he, in brute strength, surpassed all soldiers in his father's army. He could compete in strength even with gigantic creatures. While Nice takes advantage that Dor stopped the monster and accumulates energy in one of his hands and releases this energy to paralyze the monster, Frieza thinks that he doesn't have such impressive attributes, but with this technique, he is able to paralyze even super strong creatures. With the monster paralyzed by Nice, Salsa prepares a keyblade in his hand and then charges through the demon's back to kill him. And while the monster's head is separated from his body, Frieza reveals that Salsa's keyblade was capable of cutting through mountains like paper. While in active duty, he was considered the most powerful soldier in Cold's army, considerably surpassing Captain Ginyu. Well, in the end, Cooler Special Forces, using an incredibly synchronized attack, easily defeated the Demon Guardian. Proud of his soldiers, Cooler sarcastically asks Frieza if he still doubts his soldiers' powers, and the Emperor admits they weren't bad. Meanwhile, they were watched by a trio of demons. They were surprised by the invaders had managed to defeat that demon so easily, which according to them was very powerful by the standards of that world. One of the demons asked if they should alert their master about these invaders. They could be the celestial mages, and their master ordered them to report anything strange that happened. But the white cloth demon calls his companion an idiot and says that they've been in that place for decades, and that to prove their worth, they needed to face some enemies. Only then will their master recognize their power, and then they wouldn't just be apprentices and become true guardians. And then he says that these invaders are definitely not the celestial mages, and that they will be squashed like cockroaches. Something explodes the door of that place. It was the invaders, Frieza, Cooler, and their soldiers. One of the demons says that no matter what they want, they won't go through. Frieza looks at Janemba's cocoon and says that it's good to know his next soldier is well guarded. But one of the demons says he can't make Janemba his soldier. This beast has colossal power and he can't be controlled. Frieza, with an annoyed expression, says that he has known someone with colossal power and that he has seen a method to control people like that. When he says that, he remembers Brawly. The guardian insists that he can't do that to Janemba, but Frieza doesn't want to talk and asks if Cooler special forces can handle them. Salza, measuring the enemy's power by the tracker, says they only have 20,000 power, which is ridiculous. Then he tells the other soldiers that no battle tactics are needed to deal with them, just attack. Cooler special forces attack. Dor lands a punch on one of the demons. The other demon, drawing two swords, attacks Nice, who retracts his head to avoid a deadly cut and then paralyzes the guardian with his energy. And Salza, with his keyblade, attacks the guardian leader who defends himself with a sword that he takes out of his leg. But Salza fires her key blast in his hand, making him drop his sword. And then Salza attacks his enemy one more time to finish him off. But to the captain's surprise, the demon easily grabbed his blade with his hand. At the same moment, Dor, who thought he had seriously injured the other guardian with his punch, has his arm caught and is counterattacked with the punch that knocks him down at the same moment, apparently affecting his organs. The other demon, who is apparently paralyzed by Nice's technique, shows that he can move and with an energy attack hits the soldier, who is surely defeated. Salza doesn't understand what's going on. With their fighting power, they shouldn't be able to do this. But then the tracker starts measuring another result, and now their power is 150 million. 
The demon leader says that he apparently misjudged the situation, and then he breaks the soldier's hand who falls to his knees. Cooler doesn't understand what's going on either, and asks Frieza if he gave his soldiers a broken tracker. Frieza explains that no, on the contrary, those trackers are the most advanced his army currently has. What happened was that the enemies were hiding their power, so the trackers could not detect it. Cooler, disapproving Frieza's attitude, asks why he didn't tell Salza and the others. Frieza replies he wanted to see how the soldiers dealt with the sudden change in enemy power. Meanwhile, while the demon leader makes Salza suffer, he says that's what happens when they face the Celestial Guardians. But something hits the demon and pulls him away from Salza. It was an attack launched by Cooler, who walks up to his subordinate's side. Cooler scolds Salza, saying it's depressing to see his soldiers being humiliated like that and says he shouldn't have attacked without strategy. Salza apologizes. He didn't want his lord's intervention to be necessary. But Cooler, taking a good look at the enemy trio, concluded that no matter if his soldiers attacked with a good strategy or not, they wouldn't be able to defeat even one of the enemies. The difference in power was too great. That was a problem for him to solve himself. Cooler advances and facing the enemies says that they exposed his soldiers to ridicule and that group bears his name and no one shames his name and is unpunished. Now, they will be slaughtered by the Great Cooler. Cooler warns his enemies to prepare to be slaughtered by him, and as he concentrates his energy, Captain Salza's tracker detects the fighting power of 200, no, 600 billion! And not only that, it was growing even more and more. After concentrating his energy, Cooler tells Salza to try to measure his power with the tracker. Salza in thought says that his lord's power has already exceeded a trillion. That was madness. Cooler to the demon says that he could increase his power more, but that level was enough to defeat them. One of the demons says that Cooler's power can be compared to the gods of the celestial world. That was impressive. And the other demon asks if they should alter the master, since that man was no ordinary mortal. But their leader, the white clothed demon, says that they shouldn't despair. He was just a mortal. It would be a shame if he had to call the boss to deal with him. They would never get promoted that way. It was time for them to show their full power. The three concentrated their power and Salza detected that their fighting power is growing abnormally. But Cooler watches it all silently. The three complete the transformation. They are bigger and stronger. Cooler asks Salza about their power. Salza explains that individually they are weaker than Cooler, but together they can be a problem. Cooler smiles and says that was good. They would be good exercise. But those words irritate the demon who rush towards the mortal at high speed. They move around Cooler so fast, they create a whirlpool of sorts. Two of them attack Cooler, but the mortal escapes the attack with a leap. But the leader was waiting for him and attacks with a blow that could hit Cooler's neck. But Frieza's general is fast and moves to the demon's back, hitting him with a powerful kick and sends him crashing towards the ground against the other two guardians. The other two jump away, letting the leader hit the ground hard, but Cooler, extremely fast, goes behind one of them and slashes through him with an attack. The demon wonders how he can move so fast. The other demon already came to attack Cooler, but before he could escape the blow, the demon whose body he had pierced with his arm grabbed his arm. He says that he won't let Cooler get away. The demon attacks with a move called Super Demon Fist. Salza yells at his lord to watch out, and Frieza watches with a serious expression. Then a big explosion happens. Salza, who had been knocked down by the impact of the explosion, stands up. He looks at the explosion site and sees through the smoke the silhouette of someone. When the smoke disappears, it is seen that Cooler held the demon's blow with a single hand. The demon is shocked. Did he hold off his attack with one hand? And Cooler mocks the attack. Super demonic fist. It should be called worm fist. After saying that, he breaks the demon's arm, but the guardian, even with such pain, uses this as an opportunity to grab Cooler's other arm. So he yells at his boss, who is named Nikki. Nikki from above prepares his claws too, according to him, to tear Cooler to pieces. Salza, desperate for the possibility of his commander's death, asks Frieza to help him, but Frieza doesn't intend to do anything but watch. But the situation is resolved. Cooler doesn't need his arms, he has his eyes, which fire a powerful laser that hits Nikki's chest and knocks him down, which causes causes the other two fellow guardians to despair. He then addresses the other two creatures holding him, asking if they still haven't realized they were useless. And then using his finger, he shoots an energy laser that goes through the neck of one of them, which immediately falls. After that, with his hand that is crossed in the other demon, he breaks him in half. Nikki, down, yells for his two companions, who we discover are named Ginger and Sancho. 
Cooler says he thought that he would be a bigger challenge, and it was a little disappointing. But at least he could have a real fight after so many decades. But Salsa is confused. Individually, Cooler's fighting power and the demon's fighting power weren't that different. So the fight would have been much more challenging for Cooler, but instead it was a real massacre. Frieza explains that Cooler is controlling his power so precisely that during the fight he changed his power several times to attack and defend. But the changes were so quick that the tracker couldn't measure it. After saying this to Salsa, Frieza in his thoughts thinks that Cooler, despite his short training time, has energy control almost as good as his own. He'll have to pay more attention to his older brother. But the fight isn't over yet. Nikki gets up. He says that they are celestial guardians and they won't be easily defeated. Cooler says that from his point of view, they've already been defeated. He and Nikki can't do anything with that wound and the other two are already dead. But Nikki tells him to watch. The demon begins to concentrate energy and suddenly he pulls the corpses of Ginger and Sancho into his body, which seem to enter him. After that, an energy surrounds Nikki he was transforming. Salza apparently measures something on his tracker and is completely shocked by the power he saw. Then the transformation is complete and everyone beholds the great demon that was just born. It says that it was the fusion of Nikki, Ginger and Sancho. Jinisho, the most powerful demon in the world, is born. Everyone is surprised by the twist. Cooler says that they are really powerful and that can be problematic. And Frieza is just surprised that those worms have even more powers. In an instant, Janisho, who was distant from Cooler, appears in front of him, surprising the general. But the demon's punch only hits the ground, destroying it. Cooler is already behind him, preparing an energy attack that according to him would end the fight. But when Cooler fires his attack, surprisingly, an arm comes out of Janisho and defends the attack. Then another arm comes up and grabs Cooler's ankle and then throws him hard to the ground. With his enemy down, Janisho approaches while showing two more arms for the total of four arms on his back. And then with his six arms, the demon attacks Cooler with many blows. Salsa can't stand to see his master beaten up any longer. He decides to intervene before his master and commander dies. But Frieza warns him not to be stupid. At that moment, the demon was releasing a huge amount of energy. If he gets close, he will be killed. Frieza even says that Cooler is his brother and his army's general. And if he can't deal with an opponent like that, he's not worthy of living. When Janisho finishes his attack, Cooler is on the ground, clearly injured. He comments that he has never received such strong attacks in his entire life. Janisho holds Cooler's arms and legs with his extra arms and lifting the opponent up with his normal arms, prepares an energy attack that would surely kill Cooler. And so he decides it's time for the invader to die. But Cooler calls his enemy a disgusting demon and says he won't forgive him. An explosion happens. Ganesha walks away. Cooler is concentrating his energy. Salsa already knows what's going on. Cooler is transforming. He is surprised that he will see the legendary transformation of the Great Cooler, and he didn't even know if it was real. Frieza in his thoughts reveals that unlike him and his father, who needed to use containment transformations to contain their powers because they couldn't control, Cooler was different. He was always able to stay in his original form by controlling his powers. But apart from that, he still has another transformation that increased his powers even more. He reveals that he has a bad memory of this transformation, and that is in the past. He had a lot of problems because of it, but it's a little nostalgic to see that from there. Cooler finally shows off his amazing final form. He said that he didn't expect to have to use that form there, but Ganesho should feel honored to be killed by him in that form. The demon doesn't like to hear that, and while telling the invader to shut up, he throws his army at the enemy. Cooler gathers some energy in his fingertips, then lowers his arms as if finishing a cut. Then Ganesho's arms fall off. After that, at incredible speed, Cooler appears in front of Ganesho, and before the Guardian can react, the Cold Demon pierces the Guardian Demon's stomach with a single blow. Ganesho says that was impossible. He can't believe his opponent's strength. Cooler says that Ganesho's powers cannot be compared to his, and he still wasn't using all of his power. That is, Ganesho never stood a chance in this battle. But the Guardian Demon doesn't give up. He tells Cooler to shut up, and with Ginger and Sancho's mouth on his chest, Ganesho fires two energy attacks. But Cooler amazingly holds the attacks in his hand, which leaves the demon shocked. Cooler says he's tired of them, and Frieza, realizing what his brother was going to do, yells at him not to. But ignoring his younger brother, Cooler puts the energy attack back from where they came, and then Ganesho explodes. A big explosion can be seen even outside the castle. We later see a pillar of energy apparently contain the explosion, and that was done by Frieza. Salza is relieved. He thinks that if it wasn't for Frieza, he would have been killed by it. Frieza scolds his general. If he hadn't contained that explosion, he could have destroyed the entire castle and killed everyone, but the two of them, and that included Janemba, Cooler's soldiers, and even those on the ship. 
cooler with an unconvincing expression apologizes. He was too excited and besides, those enemies weren't weak opponents that he could fight with absolute control of everything. Frieza is annoyed by his brother's fake answer but decides to ignore it and goes to take a closer look at the cocoon. Frieza notes that the cocoon was unharmed despite all the pressure of the battle. But now what? How was he supposed to wake Janemba? Cooler asks if he didn't ask what he should do after he had possession of the cocoon. Frieza says no. He expected to ask those idiots, but he didn't have time. Also, Cooler killing them didn't help much. But the older brother already has the solution. How about asking Zuno, who knows everything? Frieza in his thoughts thinks that Cooler probably killed Ganesho on purpose, thinking that maybe they could need to go to Zuno for some reason. Cooler could definitely like to see how to get access to someone who knows everything. After all, information is also power. But no problem, if he keeps his brother under his vision, he won't be a problem. Frieza puts on his face a fake smile and tells his brother that it was a good idea. They will go to Zuno. And after that, they took Janemba's cocoon to the ship and then starts a new trip, this time to see Zuno. Meanwhile, on Universe 6's Planet of Destruction, Goku is lying on the grass. He's exhausted. The Saiyan God says that even now that he's a god of destruction, there's an abysm between their powers, and she is really tough in her training. Bados tells him not to take all her toughness personally, but he must think on the bright side. He has advanced considerably in his training this month. Goku agrees. He remembers that he could barely control his own body, and his power was so out of control, and trying a single blow, he would cause terrible destruction and even hurt himself. He says he's not perfect now, but at least he can fight without destroying everything around him and losing control. Bado says that although he is controlling his energy a little better, he is still a long way from being able to control 100% of his powers. And there is still a large limit of energy he can release in battle. And if he exceeds that limit, somehow it can cause great catastrophes in the universe. But Goku is determined and says he will continue to do his best in training. Vado says that for now she thinks it's best if they take a break from training. A little rest can be good for performance. How about he know a little about his universe? Is there a specific place he would like to visit? Goku is excited with this question. He says that he would like to fight Hit again. He would like to know the Earth of that universe and would also like to know the planet of the Saiyans. Vado says that fight against Hit might not be a good idea. There is a risk that the battle will get out of control and they destroy the entire universe. But visiting Earth on Sadala might be a good idea. Goku thinks a little better. He's lived on Earth his whole life, so he shouldn't find much news there. In that case, he will visit Sadala. Vados agrees and suggests they rest for the day and tomorrow they leave for Sadala. The next day, Goku and Vados arrive on planet Sadala. Looking at a large castle, Goku comments to Vados that he didn't know the Saiyan's planet was so technologically advanced. Vados says that it was not always like this and that in the past the planet went through many problems. But in the last millennium, things have changed and currently Sadala is one of the most important places in Universe 6, if not the most important. Goku asks why they're so important. Vados explains that there are a few reasons, but the main one is that the Saiyans are the most important force of order in the universe. Among all those who provide security and policing services, the Saiyans are the main ones. She tells them that in Universe 7, they have a galactic patrol to do this job. In Universe 6, they have the Saiyans. Goku remembers Kaba mentioning something like that when they first met, about Saiyans being heroes in that universe. A group of Saiyans find Goku and Vados, and noticing their strange look, Goku asks what's going on. Vados explains that they are close to the planet's royal castle and that area is probably off limits. This information is confirmed by the Saiyan guard who approaches the visitors saying that this is a prohibited area. Goku says they don't want trouble and that he would like to see Kaba, Kale and Kalifla. But the soldier is very angry with that. He asks them what they want with their captain and what relationship they have with those criminals. But Goku doesn't understand. He swears he's not a bad guy. But someone yells stop. It was Kaba who was coming there to them. Kaba reassures the soldiers he says that they can rest easy and that he would take care of those two. As the soldiers leave, Kaba asks what Goku and Vados are doing there, and also asks where Lord Champa and Mr. Vegeta are. Goku lightly explains the situation, saying that Champa wasn't doing a good job and that he's now the god of destruction. Kaba is shocked by that. Was Goku a god of destruction now? And how did he not notice the outfit that Goku was wearing? But then Kaba realizes something else. If the god of destruction was there, does that mean Salada should be destroyed? But Goku reassures the Saiyan that he's just visiting to see the planet. Calmer, Kaba says that in the case, he should meet the king. He should know there is a god visiting them. Goku quickly agrees. He would love to meet the king. After that, Kaba took Goku and Vados to Sadala's royal castle. In the castle courtyard, they were greeted with respectful greetings from the castle soldiers. Goku noted that Kaba is highly respected among the Saiyans. They treat him with a lot of respect and don't even ask him about him and Vados. 
Kaba explains that he is Sadala's elite captain, considered the number one soldier in the king's army. No one but the king himself has more authority in the army than he does. Goku asks about Kale and Cauliflower. Aren't they part of the army too? But Kaba scolds the god. He says, do not speak their name, which is a very complicated subject and that he explained later. Even seemingly confused, Goku just do as he says. They follow the castle corridor until they find a door. Kaba warns that this is the throne room. He will first enter to warn the king of their presence. Kaba enters the room when there are some sane soldiers scattered and in the background is the throne. Kaba addresses those on the throne and says that these are two visitors. They are Vados and Goku, the angel and god of destruction in the universe. The king asks about this god of destruction Goku. Wasn't the Hakishin's name Champa? But Kaba explains that now Goku was the new god. The king lets them in. Goku and Vados enter. Goku looks at the king who returns the look with a serious expression. The king raises from his throne, descends the stairs and then kneels. He respectfully greets the great god of destruction and asks the reason for his visit. Goku is amazed at his attitude. He says he doesn't have to do all that. He was just a saiyan just like them. Vados disapproves of this behavior. Apparently, the divine behavior classes were not effective. The king is very surprised. He apologizes. After that, he introduces himself, and his name is Krista. Goku also introduces himself. Looking at the king's face, he notes that it's just like Vegeta. Krista recognizes that name and asks Kaba if this Vegeta wasn't that Saiyan from Universe 7. Kaba confirms and says that Mr. Vegeta and Lord Goku are great rivals. Krista, understanding the situation, says it's a little curious that a Saiyan from another universe became a god of their universe. Goku agrees it is kind of weird, but the king treats him very friendly, asking if he would like to join them in a feast. He wants to know more about the Saiyans of Universe 7 and is sure that Goku has a lot of interesting things to tell him. But unfortunately, Goku can't. He's grounded but a god grounded? Krista is very surprised by that, who explains the situation is Vados, saying that in one of their trainings, Goku ended up not following her instructions and he lost control of his powers and destroyed a large part of the universe. She needed to go back in time to fix this mess, so she decided to give Goku a punishment. She decided to forbid him to eat for a month, and as he was a god, he didn't need to eat to survive. But mentally, he still feels hungry from having been a mortal until recently, so it was the perfect punishment. But Krista is impressed by that. Because of the lack of control, he destroys a large part of the universe. Suddenly, the king makes a serious expression, and then he makes a request. He wants Goku to fight him, leaving everyone in that place completely shocked. After Sadala's ruler, Krista suddenly challenged the god of destruction, Goku, to combat. They headed to a vast desert, the region as far away from civilization as possible. Goku and Krista face each other as Kaba and Vados look on. A worried Kaba says that even though they are far from civilization, he doubts that such powerful men's battle will not affect the planet. But Vados, helpful as ever, takes care of it. She creates a force field around them. This force field will contain their energy so that it does not harm the planet, and it will also prevent them from being felt. That means they are completely under the radar now. Goku, as he begins to emanate his energy, says that Vados helped them, and now they can fight carefree. Krista, while taking off his cape and also emanating his energy, says this is perfect. Kaba, dissatisfied with the whole situation, says he doesn't know what the king has in his head to challenge Goku to a battle. Vados theorizes that it is perhaps in the nature of Saiyans to challenge powerful people, and she also asks if Krista is powerful. Kaba responds that Krista is probably the strongest Saiyan to ever exist in the universe. He tells that many, many years ago, an extremely powerful army invaded Sadala, and that army was so powerful that the Saiyan army could not do anything against them. It was a massacre, but an absurdly powerful child was among the enemy hordes, and that child single-handedly defeated them all. That child was Krista. Vado says this is impressive. Kaba agrees and continues to tell the story saying that Krista was considered a great hero of Sadala, and he was becoming more and more popular until he managed to become king and even though he was not part of the nobility of the planet, which was unprecedented in history, from Sadala. Since then, he has been a great king, and it was thanks to him that Sadala stopped being some barbaric planet because what it is today. Kaba even says that Krista is probably the best thing that Saiyan race ever had. But Vado says that Sadala's process of change and development must have taken many centuries, and Saiyans don't live that long. But Kaba explains that the king is special. Many years ago, harboring a great desire to protect Sadala, he went to Namek and made a wish for the Dragon Balls and became immortal. Since then, Krista has ruled Sadala, and that's been nearly a thousand years. 
Vado says that she is impressed. A Saiyan who was already extremely powerful in his childhood and who is already over a thousand years old. He must be a very special warrior. But Kaba is sad. He says that Goku is now a god of destruction and that even King Krista should be easily defeated. But Vado says things that are not quite like that. She explains that because he doesn't control his power well as a god of destruction, Goku has a huge limit of power he can use in his fight. This means that he will fight very limited, using a small percentage of his power. Krista has a chance to win. Goku and Krista have already raised their key, both fighters emanating their power, and then they advance to begin combat. When they clash their fists, only the pressure of the impact destroys the ground around them. After that, the two disappear at high speed and start an exchange of blows so fast that only their figures can be seen. Krista kicks Goku who defends. Goku punches Krista who disappears to dodge. Kaba is impressed. They are so fast that he can barely see them, and they are so strong that just the impact of their blows makes his bones vibrate. Goku and Krista continue with an intense exchange of blows, both fighters attacking, defending and dodging with great skill. At one point, Goku tries to land a blow on Krista, but the king disappears from his front and goes to his back preparing a kick. Goku manages to block the kick, but is thrown by the force of the attack. Krista accompanies Goku and tries to land another hit. Goku disappears to dodge, but Krista anticipates where he is going to appear. Nearly punches Goku in the face, who narrowly dodges it. Kaba is impressed. Goku is under pressure. Goku in his thoughts thinks that Krista is stronger than he thought at the moment. But even though he was not transformed, he was using the power of a Super Saiyan 3. But even so, he is at a disadvantage. The distraction is costly and Goku is hit by Krista's hard punch in the chest. And he clearly feels the blow quite a bit. The destroyer tries to fight back with an attack, but Krista disappears in front of him and reappears on his back and lands a kick on the destroyer. Goku is thrown a few meters away by the king's strength, but manages to stop. But Krista doesn't want to give the god time to think and launches two key blasts at him. Goku doesn't stand still and after creating two Kienzans in his hand, he launches them at Krista. The attack collides and the Kienzans win and head towards Krista, who deftly dodges it by lying in the air and passing between the two energy discs. But Goku manipulates the disc to return to the king, but Krista manages to grab one of the discs without being cut and throws it at the second. Both explode. But this was the opportunity that Goku wanted and he appears on the back of the king, ready to hit him with the attack. But Krista sees him and lands a strong kick in the abdomen of the Saiyan God, who is very surprised because he was sure he did the instant transmission right in Krista's blind spot and hid his key. How did the king notice him? Krista wastes no time and while Goku is still stunned by what just happened, he moves on to the Saiyan's back and fires two energy attacks from his hands that launch the God of Destruction into the ground, destroying a portion of the ground. After gaining space by knocking his opponent to the ground, Krista forms a large ball of energy, then launches it at Goku. Goku holds off the attack but has a hard time. And while the God is distracted by the major attack, Krista forms a minor attack in his hand and thinks that attack will end the fight. Goku, to get rid of the bigger attack, uses the Hakai, but Krista takes advantage of the fact that he was blinded by the attack and appears right in front of him ready to land the next attack. And then a huge explosion happens. Kaba, impressed, says that he's never seen King Krista use so much power in an attack. And if Goku was hit by that, Bavados reassures the young Saiyan probably seeing something he doesn't. After the explosion, he sees a large crater in the ground and in the center of his crater is Krista, who apparently hit nothing but the ground with his attack. And behind the king in the sky was Goku who was now using Ultra Instinct. Krista watching his opponent says that he's finally transformed but that doesn't look like a Saiyan transformation. Goku explains that this is Ultra Instinct, a special ability of angels that not even the gods of destruction can control well. Krista says that Kaba mentioned something like that when he got back from the Tournament of Power. Advancing against Goku with great determination, Krista tells the god to show him the power of his Ultra Instinct. Krista tries to string attacks on Goku, but the god of destruction dodges all the blows with apparent ease. Kaba apparently worried asked Vados if Goku should be using this ability in the Tournament of Power, he seemed to suffer a lot using it. Vados explains that in the Tournament of Power, Goku still had the body of a mortal, and because this is an advanced divine technique, his body suffered when using it. But now that he's a god, he has an immortal body. That won't be a problem anymore. 
But in her thoughts, Vados thinks the problem was something else. If Goku uses Ultra Instinct too much and unleashes too much power, he could lose control, and that would be a big problem. For now, even using this ability, he is using a safe power level, even lower than what he used against Jiren. But the time between balance and imbalance is very thin at this point. That is, if Goku uses a little more power, he can lose control at any moment. While dodging Krista's attacks, Goku also thinks about his situation. He's at the limit of the power he can use, and if he raises his power just a little more, he might lose control. If he loses control, Vados will intervene in the fight which means he will have lost. But he doesn't want to lose, he wants to win. Goku finally counters Krista with a punch. The king blocks the attack but the destroyer's force is so great that it throws the mortal Saiyan away causing him to destroy the ground to stop his body. But still even blocking Goku's attack, Krista spits out blood, clearly very stunned by the attack. The king notes that not only has his opponent's defensive ability changed, but his offense is also much more powerful. This ultra instinct is really an amazing technique, but Goku is already after the king and he apologizes, but he needs to get this over with. However, to Goku's surprise, when he would land a finishing blow on the king, he simply misses which leaves the god of destruction very confused. Krista wastes no time, and then, accumulating a strange energy in his fist, rushes towards Goku to land a blow on him. Goku clearly dodges, but strangely the attack lands, and it was a great attack. The destroyer is thrown very violently into the force field, causing destruction on impact. But it's not just Goku who's very surprised by the attack. Kaba and Vados didn't understand very well either. And Vados notes that Krista's last attack far exceeded the power he was going to use in the fight so far. Goku while getting up thinks that he is sure he dodged that blow and also that he would land that attack. What happened? And what absurd strength was that? But the destroyer's reflections are interrupted when he looks up into the sky and sees something. Did he transform? In the sky, Krista shows a new form. Kaba is surprised. Can the king transform and what form is this? Doesn't look like the average Super Saiyan. But Vados isn't the least bit surprised. After all, it's only to be expected that the millennial Saiyan warrior with a prodigious track record like his would have some sort of hidden power, right? But Goku recognized that energy. He's already felt something similar. And if that's what he's thinking, it could be very serious. And while he thinks that, he is remembering Brawly. But the time for speculation is over. Krista is ready to finish the battle and screams for the God of Destruction to get ready too. Krista lunges at the God of Destruction, who was getting up to react, when suddenly he is startled to see around the king the image of an Uzaru roaming at him. Goku is very scared. What is that? Kaba yells for him to get out of there, and then a gigantic explosion happens. Kaba has to hold on to Vados to not being blown away by the wind, and he does so. He wonders if he wasn't going too far for a friendly fight, and Vados in agreement with the young Saiyan says that apparently Saiyans take even the most random fights very seriously. When the wind blows over, Kaba is finally able to release the angel and asks who the winner was. At the center of the crater is Krista, but he is alone there. Did he miss the attack? Kaba asks where Goku is. Vados, who has apparently already seen him, with a serious expression, questions if he really reached this point. And Krista also seeing something says it doesn't look good. And Kaba just now seeing that what had happened asks what this is. And then we finally see Goku, who has a completely different appearance, a demonic appearance, and surrounded by the energy of destruction. Kaba asks what that is. Goku has changed a lot and he has never felt anything so dark in his entire life. Goku with a devilish smile raises his hand and says he's going to destroy everything. Krista with a worried expression takes his fighting stance, but then someone puts his finger on Goku's neck and he quickly returns to normal, very confused. Goku asks what happened and what he was doing up there. Vados, who was already behind him and was the one who turned him back to normal, explains that at the moment Krista was going to hit him. Goku increased the Ultra Instinct's power level so he could escape the attack. And how he was already at his limit of power he could use even this quickly increase in power was enough for him to lose control. Goku now understanding what happened lowers his head and disappointed assumes his defeat. Krista also clearly very relieved undoes his transformation as he sighs in relief that it's all over. But Vados has some thoughts about what just happened. She notes that actually since Krista's last attack was direct and obvious, Goku should have been able to dodge it without raising his powers. But he probably saw or felt something that she and Kaba couldn't and it distracted him. Because this, he was late to dodge and needed to increase his powers to dodge. It seemed that this man named Krista really has something very special. But now with a relaxed smile, Vados calls out to them to heal them and fix their clothes. 
Some minutes later, everyone is talking peacefully in the king's palace. Goku and Krista's wounds have already been healed, and their clothes have been also repaired by Vados. Goku thanks the king, saying it was so much fun finding him, but he hopes that next time the king won't hide his real powers. Krista smiles, surprised that Goku noticed, but he also tells the Saiyan god that he also realized that he was far from using his full power. Goku confirms, explaining that until he manages to control his power well, he has a very big limit on how much energy he can expend. And then Goku asks why Krista didn't participate in the tournament of power. Things could have been very different for Universe 6 if he had been there. Krista explains that he promised a long time ago that he would always stay on Sadala to protect the planet and the people, and that's why he doesn't leave the planet. This surprises Goku who says he is a very responsible king. Goku's admiration is understandable, as he would certainly never give up a good fight for something like that. And now, much to Kaba's annoyance, Goku calls him to see Kale and Cauliflower. Kaba scolds the destroyer, reminding him not to talk about them there. Goku apologizes, embarrassed. But Krista doesn't care. He says that Goku is a god, and he has nothing to do with the planet's internal conflicts. The king says that Kaba can take him to them, but he must be careful and not go into too dangerous places. Sadala's elite captain accepts his king's order. Krista says he now has kingdom business to attend to. But before he goes, he asks Goku that, in case he sees Kale, try to get some sense into his head. And he completes saying that his daughter is very problematic. Goku is shocked. Is he Kale's father? Kaba laughs embarrassed. He forgot to warn about that. A few minutes later, Goku, Kaba, and Vados are flying across the planet. On the way, Goku observes a poor village where the people seem to live precariously. The visitor asks Kaba why the villages in the region are so poor compared to the main city and the king's palace. Kaba explains that lately some regions are going through difficult times because of crime. And this region specifically is rebel territory, and they are suffering a lot from the war. This surprises Goku. Is the planet at war? Kaba says yes. There is a revolutionary force that wants to remove King Krista from power. And the one who commands his revolutionary force is Kalifla. This surprises Goku a lot. Kalifla is a revolutionary? But on second thought, now Goku understands why Kale and Kalifla's names cause so much resentment back in the capital and the palace. And Kale, the king's daughter, is a revolutionary leader's best friend. That must be pretty sad. Kaba explains that Kale, like many other people, disagreed with the king's rule and revolted against him. Although Krista is a great hero of Sadala, many have forgotten his heroic efforts over time and many generations have passed. Krista doesn't make a point of reminding everyone about it so that his fame doesn't increase too much and spread across the universe. Since, if his fame spreads across the universe, many aliens would want to go to the planet to prove their powers against the king, which could put Sadala at risk. But because they don't remember Krista's deeds, many see him as a tyrant complacent with power, and so they decide to create a revolutionary force to remove him from throne. Kalifla commands this revolution. Kaba also explains that in the beginning, the revolutionaries were just criminal groups that dominated small regions. But in recent times, the rebels have gained funding from a tycoon who takes advantage of wars taking place in the universe. Since then, the revolutionary forces have grown a lot and are giving a lot of work to the imperial forces. Kaba finally stops, and Goku and Vados do the same. The Saiyan captain points in the direction and says that the castle that served as a base for the rebels is there. He's already gotten too close, and he's already taking a risk. If he goes any further, he could have a lot of problems. Goku says that everything is fine and that they can go on their own. Meanwhile, in the rebellion castle, Cauliflower devours a piece of meat while Kale watches her. A subordinate enters the room saying that a guy and a woman outside wanting to see her. Cauliflower, with her mouth stuffed with meat, asks who it is. The soldier says he's forgotten their names but describes that man wore a funny necklace and the woman had a halo like an angel. Kalifla immediately scolds the soldier saying that it must be Champa and Vados and that it was to send them in. The soldier, fearing Kalifla's anger, hastens to obey. Kalifla is curious about the reason for Champa's visit. She says that maybe he wants to ask them to fight him again. If that's the case, she can't accept it. She's too busy, but maybe they could accept it in exchange for some favor for their cause. After coming up with this idea, she asks what Kale thinks of it. But Kale just thinks Kalifla is really smart, and she agrees. And she also says that Champa will be stunned to see her on the throne. But when the gates open, they're the one who is stunned when they see Goku wearing a God of Destruction costume walking in saying hello. Some minutes later, Goku finishes explaining how it all happened and he became a God of Destruction. 
Cauliflaw now understands and agrees that Champa really seemed to be a very neglectful god. But then the Saiyan girl gets straight to the point. She wants Goku to fight her. He is surprised by the sudden request. He thought that after he became a god, people would be afraid of him. But it's the opposite. It seems that everyone is eager to fight him. Cauliflaw justifies her request by saying that she won't miss the chance to fight a Saiyan god of destruction. She's sure that if they fight, she'll get stronger, like last time. But Goku apologizes, he can't. He explains that his powers are still unregulated and if he fights he could hurt her. She's too fragile to fight him. After all, she can't even transform into a Super Saiyan 3. Kalifla, annoyed by what Goku said, says that if that's the case, she'll make the fight more interesting for him, and then calls Kale. Kale, as usual, is not understanding anything. Cauliflaw with a smile of someone hiding something says it's time for them to do that. Goku is curious, what are they going to do? And then the two Saiyan girls start doing a very special dance. Goku immediately recognizes those moves and is then completely surprised. And then they complete the movement. And when that happens, a lot of energy is released. And according to Goku, it's a very powerful energy. And so a new Saiyan warrior is born. The Metamoru fusion of Kale and Cauliflaw, Kale who is of course ready to kick his ass. But Goku is still confused. How did they both learn that dance? Kale explains that after the tournament of power, Kale and Cauliflaw were very impressed and excited by Kefla's power. So they asked the Supreme Kai Fuwa to keep the Potara earrings so they could fuse whenever they wanted. But Fuwa did not allow it, saying that the Potara's earrings are divine artifacts and could not be used that way. But with a little threat, the Kaioshin revealed another way to fuse, the dance of the Metamoru race. So the two went to the planet of the race and asked the Metamorus to teach them to dance. That's how Kefla was born. Goku finally got it. It looked like the Metamoru race is not extinct in Universe 6 as it is in Universe 7. Kefla reminds Goku that he wanted to see a Super Saiyan 3, so just watch. Kefla begins to emanate a large amount of energy, energy so powerful that it makes Sadala tremble. And as lightning forms around the Saiyan warrior, her hair starts to grow. That's Super Saiyan 3. Goku is impressed by her power. That was no ordinary Super Saiyan 3. Her hair was green like that weird Kale transformation. That form was much more powerful than any ordinary Super Saiyan 3. Kale asks if the king is seeing this. That will be all for him. From his palace, Krista seems to sense Kale's energy and has a very serious expression. Maybe angry, maybe worried, who knows. After that, Kale asks Goku if he's ready to face the most powerful warrior in the universe. Goku is excited, and while doing his fighting stance, he says it's going to be amazing. But a sudden blow puts the god of destruction to sleep. Kale complains, what was going on? Why she did it? Vados justifies it by saying that Goku has already abused his power once today, and if he fought her, he would definitely do it again, and that would be very dangerous. She says that it's best to take him to rest, so maybe next time. Kale, completely disappointed, undoes the transformation and says he's an idiot. In space, while Goku's away, Vados says that despite the scares, she is very grateful that Goku chose to visit this planet first. She is sure that seeing the powerful people who live in Sadala, he is more excited to be a god of the universe. He also also understood his limits better and will definitely train more willingly to improve. Today was a good day. Frieza's spaceship travels through space, inside it more specifically, inside the training room as Cooler and Frieza, who are apparently in yet another one of several intense training sessions. Cooler taunts his brother saying that Frieza is starting to put more effort into their trainings. Doesn't that worry him? But Frieza with a fake smile on his face says no. To the contrary, intense training will make him much more stronger. But their conversation is interrupted by Berry Blue who warns them that their destination is close. Cooler asks Frieza if he should call his soldiers, but Frieza says it's not necessary. On the Zuno's planet, there is nothing threatening for them. The ship finally lands on the planet. Frieza and Cooler leave surrounded by many soldiers, but something is wrong. They feel a very powerful energy in that place. Cooler asks his brother if he can feel it too. Frieza says yes, and they should be careful. They fly across the planet and Frieza sees something. They were brutally murdered, and when the two land, they see that those people who have served Zuno are dead. As they advance, they see a monster, similar to a chimera, and that monster is holding Zuno in its mouth. On top of this monster is a strange creature, and when the creature looks to the brothers, they get very tense. Frieza says that just the presence of that person makes his body feel heavy, and Cooler asks his younger brother if he thinks they can beat this thing. Frieza says he doesn't know. He never felt such a presence of pressure before. But the creature begins to show an weird personality. The monster with a personality a little cheesy tells them not to worry. He just wants the chubby little guy there. This behavior leaves Frieza and Cooler a little shocked. And Frieza comments that Guy had a bit of eccentric behavior. 
That strange person says goodbye, takes a card that has some strange design on it, he throws that card on the floor and a magic rune appears, and then he enters together with the monster and Zuno in that magic rune. After that they disappear. Apparently it was like a magical dimensional portal. Frieza scolds Cooler, why didn't he do anything? But Cooler says he still hasn't processed that situation very well. But they weren't the only ones there. On an asteroid close to the planet, someone was watching. This person in thought says that if Zuno is being target, that means the next target will be Super Dragon Balls. Suddenly the Super Dragon Balls are completely destroyed. The person responsible for this was a woman who says it's good to be able to blow things up again, especially these damn relics. She is accompanied by three other mysterious people. One of them calls her Tyra, saying she did a good job. Now Zarama's magic cannot be used in this realm. And that's how the Super Dragon Balls were destroyed by four mysterious enemies. And what did they mean about Zarama's magic not being usable? Now on the planet Shiriaru, Granola is arriving at Monaito's house. He enters very angry, which causes curiosity in the old Namekian. Granola explains that on his last mission, he discovered that Frieza is still alive. This is clearly a reference to the Dragon Ball Super manga, when in Chapter 68, Granola found from Eric that Frieza was alive. And this conversation is a reworked version of the scene where Granola talks to Monaito about Frieza's rebirth in Chapter 69. Well, when Granola tells Monaito that Frieza is alive, the Namekian tells him not to do something stupid. If he tries to fight Frieza, he will be killed. But Granola says he can't let Frieza go unpunished. He needs to pay for what he did, just like the Saiyans. But suddenly the Dragon Ball in Monaito's house suffers a strange incident. Granola asks what's going on, and before long the orb turns to stone. Granola walks to the orb and takes it in hand. Apparently in this Dragon Ball Hakai reality, he won't be able to ask to be the strongest in the universe, which means the Granola arc won't happen. Monaito is feeling strange for some reason. He feels something really bad. Now on planet Namek, the Grand Elder is sitting on his throne, if we can call it that. He is very reflective when a Namekian comes to his house and says that for some reason, the Dragon Balls have suddenly stopped working. The Elder, like Monaito, feels something strange, something very bad. Now on planet Earth, on the celestial platform, Dende is reflective, apparently very worried about something. Popo approaches Kami-sama and asks what's going on. The Earth God doesn't answer to his assistant. He just thinks that he feels the Dragon Balls have stopped working and that he has a sense of loss he can't explain. And by telepathy, he asks someone if he felt it too. The person Dende asked this was Piccolo, who was reflecting on a rock next to his house. Piccolo receiving Dende's telepathic question says yes. For some reason he can't explain. He also senses that something very bad is about to happen. Meanwhile, at the place where the Super Dragon Balls were destroyed, that person who kidnapped Zuno finally appears. The creature arrives at the location through the magical portal it opened on the Zuno's planet. Arriving at the companions and seeing that the orbs have already been destroyed, the creature complains saying that it missed the show. Another member of the group, upon seeing Zuno's kidnapper, comments that apparently the other mission was also successful. The woman named Tyra comments that without Zarama's magical power, at Zuno's knowledge, they sure won't be able to resist them. She's definitely talking about the 12 universes. But the strange man who is appearing to be the leader of the group says that they had a big victory today. But it is better not to underestimate their enemies. And after saying that, he tells his companions that it's time to leave before those rats get in the way. Who is he talking about? Some hours later, a door to a strange room opens. When a person enters this door, another person asks, How was it, master? In the center of this room is a large table with several chairs, but only two of those chairs are occupied. One of the people who is sitting answers the question that the other has just asked, saying that by the look on the master's face, it certainly didn't go well. The so-called master, as he walks towards the table, says that they were deceived. The celestial mages did not return to their realm, but to Zeno's realm. Rajin, the great mage of invocations, kidnapped Zeno. And now, the super dragon balls were destroyed. One of the people sitting, who is revealed to be a man with spiky hair, similar to Vegeta, says he warned him. The master says he did his best for them to be cautious, keeping the apprentices on alert, but without confirmation that the enemies were indeed in Zeno's realm. He couldn't take any more serious action. Furthermore, this was no time for accusations. Zuno was kidnapped and the Super Dragon Balls were destroyed. Zuno's realm was without a doubt the greatest source of information and the greatest source of magic power. The spiky-haired man says that if the master knows who kidnapped Zuno, it's because he saw it happen. Why didn't he stop Rajin? The master, apparently bothered by all the questioning, replies that apparently his Saiyan blood will still speak louder than his wisdom by the looks of it. He knows very well that a fight between himself and a celestial 
single mage could cause the destruction of the entire universe 7. He could never start a battle of such a level without the permission of the gods of the universe. The spiky haired man argues against the master saying that he would rather lose Zuno than break a simple rule. He liked his primal blood better. The third person at the table finally decides to say something. He intervenes in the discussion to side with the master saying that the master of the celestial guardians cannot afford to break rules. He did very well, that's what Master Anzen would do. This man who spoke in defense of the master asked if he has discovered anything about Janemba. The master finally searching the main chair at the table pulls the chair to sit down while reporting yes. He found the silence of the guardians in Universe 7's Makai World Strange. He went there and found them dead. The master continues telling the story saying that after finding the three guardians dead, he went to Zuno to find out if whoever had done that was the celestial mages or not. But irony of fate, the thieves of Janemba Cocoon were there. It was the mortal Frieza and another mortal who, from what he heard, was called Cooler. From what he understood, they also went after Zuno's wisdom. Hearing this report, the spiky-haired man is again angry. Why didn't the master take Janemba? That would be an easy one for him, as stealing candy for a baby. But the master again justifies himself by the rules, saying that his companion knows very well that mortals, whether good or bad, are citizens of a universe, and they, celestial guardians, are mediators of the realms. They cannot harass them without the permission of their respective gods. To do so would be a diplomatic offense. But the questioner says these rules are ridiculous. He doesn't think they should follow them so rigidly. But the master replies that is why he is the master and not him. The other with irony says that he is a great master. After all, he's only seen defeat since he took over. The master does not accept this offense silently and with the same irony asks what victories your majesty had as a leader. This makes the man very angry, and hitting the table he stands up while transforming into a form that looks like the Super Saiyan Blue. The other man on the table apparently doesn't approve of this, and so he too stands up, emanating an aura of Ki. And well, there's no way to know exactly what that is, but on the surface this man has angel-like traits, and this aura could be something like the Ultra Instinct. In any case, he scolds the Saiyan, saying that he doesn't think it's appropriate to raise Ki before the Master. The Saiyan is clearly worried about this reaction, and after both stare at each other for a few seconds, seconds they back off. After that, the angel-like guardian opines, saying that he thinks it's better to seek solutions than criticisms at this time. And he asks the master what he intends to do. But before listening to the master's answer, it suggests that the time for being discreet is over, and they need to alert Zeno's realm of events so that the correct measures can be taken. The master agrees. He says that they must alert the authorities immediately. The kidnapping of Zuno and the destruction of the Super Dragon Balls can mean nothing but war. Meanwhile, in Universe 7, Beerus is fishing in the planet's lake while Whis watches him and the oracle fish sleeps in the aquarium. Whis, bothered by something, says that Vegeta has been in that place for two weeks. Two weeks, Beerus says. He didn't even notice. Whis continues saying that at this point, the oxygen aura he put around Vegeta must be running out. And if he still hasn't come back, it's because he's either dead or he's having a hard time. But so what? Nobody told him to be an idiot. He was so jealous by Goku becoming a god and gaining new powers that he wanted to resort to such dangerous methods to evolve faster. Anything bad that happens is his fault. In his thoughts, Whis reflects on where Vegeta is, the anti-life dimension, the most harmful place that can exist in the universe, a dimension where the universe sends everything it discards to avoid its own destruction. It is such a bad place that even the gods of destruction avoid going there, because even these deities feel uncontrollable with the adversities of that place. That's where Vegeta went two weeks ago. But Whis decides to speak again, and this time to provoke Beerus, saying that he is nervous because Vegeta has been in that dimension mention for much longer than he managed to stay the first time he entered. Beerus tells the angel not to talk nonsense. He was there for the first time millions of years ago. Vegeta is still light years away from him. Suddenly, this conversation is interrupted by the oracle fish who shouts, Death! Lots of death! Beerus asks what he's talking about. The fish continues, very powerful enemies. Death! A lot of death! The universes are in danger! Beerus approaches the fish, but he sleeps again. But suddenly, the sound of thunder can be heard. Many lightning strikes from the sky, and then a big tornado. That worries Beerus. A lot of energy was accumulating there, and then he tells Whis that if it spread out, the universe will. But Angel already knows. And by invoking his staff, he forms a protective globe around that area. A large amount of energy is released at that location, creating a huge explosion. But everything is contained by the force field created by Whis. After it's all over and Whis undoes the force field, we can see Vegeta who is extremely injured. It doesn't take long for the Saiyan to finally pass out. 
falling to the ground. Beerus in disbelief asks Whis if Vegeta destroyed that entire dimension. The angel confirms which makes the god of destruction complain, this guy has no limits. But he discreetly smiles, perhaps an admiring smile. Whis tells Beerus he's going to take care of Vegeta. In the meantime, he'd better go to the meeting of the gods or else he'll be late. This scares Beerus. He forgot the meeting. A few minutes later, Whis has already healed Vegeta, changed his clothing, and is now putting him to bed. Whis, in thought, says that Vegeta was so exhausted that the amount of ki in his body was less than 5%. Almost every bone in his body is broken or fractured, and his organs are severely damaged. If not for the angel's care, the Saiyan prince would be dead in literally a few minutes. All this just for the desire to become the strongest. Mortals are really fascinating, but Whis's musings are interrupted when he receives a call from his staff. He realizes that there's definitely something serious going on. In Universe 6, Vados has apparently created four cubes that appear to be made with Kachin. Meanwhile, Goku is waiting. He tells her to start. Vados throws the four cubes against the Saiyan God. Goku fires two Hakai energy balls, which completely explode the first two cubes. After that, Goku goes up to the third cube and touching it with his hands, again uses the Hakai, but this time turns the metal into dust. And lastly is hit by the fourth block, which has been thrown with such force that even the God of Destruction is being dragged away. But he again uses the Hakai, this time making the big metal cube disappear completely. After getting rid of all the cubes, Goku turns to Vados and gives her a like. Sometime later, Goku has already been healed by Vados, and now he's sitting down for another class. Vados explains that there are a few ways the Hakai can be used. By blowing up the target, turning the target to dust, and making the target disappear completely. Goku in two months of training has already managed to learn all these forms, and for that, Vados congratulates him, saying that it took Champa about a year to be able to do this. Goku thanks her and says that Vados' training is amazing, but Vados says that there is something that Goku must understand very well. The essence of the energy of destruction. Goku is confused. Vados had told him once that destruction, energy, and Hakai were different things, but he didn't quite understand. Vados explains that the energy of destruction is a source of energy, while Hakai is a product of that energy. And to exemplify, she says it's like Kamehameha, which is done through ordinary ki energy. In this comparison, the energy of destruction is like ki, and Kamehameha is like Hakai. Vados also says that the energy of destruction can be simulated with training, like Vegeta and Topo Do, but this simulation cannot be compared to the true energy of destruction that the gods of destruction have. Goku asks why that energy of destruction is so different from ordinary ki, and why he feels so bad every time he uses that energy, and it's always so hard to control. Vado says that in fact this energy is very different from ordinary ki or divine ki. That's because the true energy of destruction is a living energy. Goku asks what she means by living energy. She explains that when this energy is inserted into someone's body, it takes the form of a spiritual being with its own consciousness and desires. This means that ever since Goku received this energy with him in the ritual, another creature has come into existence with him. Goku is shocked. There's a ghost inside him? Vado says that the best comparison is that there's a demon inside him, because the energy is made up of pure destructive and negative desire. And worse, the spiritual being doesn't just want to live in Goku's body, but to dominate it. Goku asks if this is what happened to him during the fight against Krista. She confirms. And she also explains that in order to keep the energy under control, Goku's body unconsciously uses his ki to suppress this energy. The less control Goku has over this power, the more energy his body needs to keep this creature under control. And as a result, the amount of energy and power he can use in battle is less. At the time when he found Krista, Goku had very little control over his power, so the percentage of the total power he could use in that fight was very low. As Krista pressured Goku into battle, he ended up exceeding the limit of power he could use. And so the energy of destruction managed to momentarily take control. He was possessed. But Goku says that in this last month of training, he managed to control his power as a god of destruction much better. That means that now he can use more power, right? Vados confirms, saying that the amount of power he can use has increased considerably, and now the level of power he can use is already higher than the total power he used during the Tournament of Power. She goes on and says that now Goku is at least the fifth most powerful among the gods of destruction. Goku gets really excited about those words from his master, saying he wants to train more and more. Vados laughs. He's really very different from Champa, but unfortunately they had to stop. After all, had he forgotten that he had to go to the meeting of the Gods of Destruction? Goku had forgotten, but he didn't want to go. What would he do there? Vado says that actually the purpose of these meetings is for the gods to talk about matters pertaining to work, involving the universes, about work experiences and things like that. But since angels traditionally don't attend these meetings to make the gods more comfortable, what actually happens is that they talk about silly things and make silly disputes. Goku, knowing about the disputes that are made, is more excited. Maybe he can fight someone there. 
Vado suddenly receives a call, similar to what happened to Whis, like I said in the previous video. She deduced that something important is going on and says, as Goku doesn't know the meeting place, he's going to take him there quickly, and then go meet the Grand Priest. Between each of the 12 universes, there is a planet that is considered a neutral base. This planet is even tougher than the Supreme Planet, and also tougher than the Planet of Destruction. On these planets, the millenary meetings of the Gods of Destruction are held. Inside the planet, Likir and Hellas hold bows. Hela says she's the best archer in all the universes, but Likir assures her that she's the best for now. On the other side of the planet is Sidra, who agrees to serve as a target for the two just to show the power of his shield and also his incredible speed. The first shot is coming. The destroyer of the ninth universe notices and deflects. The shot goes straight through, destroying a mountain and who knows what else. Sidra recognizes that shot is Likir's arrow and it was very easy to dodge. However, another shot follows and it hits the destroyer, cracking his shield. That was Hellas's arrow, which according to Sidra was so accurate that it didn't destroy anything in its path. So discreet that he didn't see it coming and so strong that it cracked his shield, which is the most powerful shield among the gods. Hellas brags to Likir, she's the best. Meanwhile, Rumshi and Moscow are having a power struggle, which seems like a sumo wrestling match. Both gods put in a lot of effort and it apparently is a little further from seeing a victor. Arak, Jin, and Iwan talk, and in that conversation the Destroyer of Universe 1 reveals that it has been approximately 10 million years since he has cut his hair. He's cute like that, isn't he? Well, Jin and Arak decide not to answer. Meanwhile, Beerus and Catella are in another deadly arm wrestling match. Bellman watching says he will face whoever wins, or rather, he will face Quitella. Beerus tells the destroyer of Universe 11 to shut up, he will win. But the truth is that Belmont doesn't want anyone to win, because if that happens, he's going to have to do some work. But suddenly, the relaxed atmosphere becomes very tense. Something catches the attention of the 11 gods of destruction present in that place. What catches everyone's attention is the arrival of the 12th destroyer, Son Goku, who upon arriving and realizing that everyone is staring at him, is very apprehensive, realizing that they still don't like him. Goku runs to Beerus asking him to help him get along with the guys, but Beerus tells him to leave. He doesn't want to embarrass himself with the others. As if he were popular, Quitella says. The atmosphere starts to get even more tense. That's because the gods start to complain about Goku's presence. Jin sneers at the novice's arrival. Likir says that as if all the trouble he caused wasn't enough, he still became a god. But Goku asks his comrades to calm down. He didn't want to be a god, but Rumshi doesn't believe it. After all, did he start flattering Zeno for nothing? Iwan tries to pacify the situation saying that Goku is now a colleague and they need to get along. Hellas agrees and says that having a handsome god at these gatherings is a rare thing and a lady like her is grateful for that. Sidra falsely agrees saying that it would really be nice for them to welcome their new colleague and he says that by raising his energy. Kotella agrees and does the same. Beerus goes to Goku's side. Not that he cares about this idiot, but he doesn't like to see cowardice. Goku smiles. He was already tired of just training. It would be good to fight. The planet trembles with the release of energy from the gods of destruction. Kutella is the first to advance, but they all stop when a tube of light falls on the planet. Goku asks if Beerus is feeling that, and the destroyer of Universe 7 says yes. Whoever it is, it's very powerful. The one who just arrived is Picon, who tells the gods that they need to talk. When the 12 gods of destruction are gathered, the first thing Picon does is talk to Goku, acknowledging him as a Saiyan who made a remarkable and memorable participation in the Tournament of Power. He says that he had heard that Goku had become a god of destruction, but because of the problems that had arisen recently, he didn't have time to dwell into the matter, but congratulates Goku. The Saiyan is surprised to be so famous, but thanks for the congratulations. Picon says that as Goku is a new god, he probably hasn't had time to dwell into the history of the universes yet. So he'll explain it briefly for Goku to understand, and the other gods will also understand what's going on. Picon begins by explaining that a long time ago, what they call existence was a great void. But seven extremely powerful creatures called Supreme Deities were born. One of these deities, they known very well, is the Grand Zeno. Goku's first doubt arises at that moment. Wasn't Zeno the supreme being of all the universes? Is there anyone as powerful as him? Picon explains that Zeno really is an absolute being in the 12 universes. However, the 12 universes form only one realm, which is known as Zeno's realm. But there are six other realms besides this one, ruled by other supreme deities. Goku is very surprised, so the 12 universes are just part of everything that exists. Picon says yes. The 12 universes form just one realm out of seven. In each realm, there are its own universes, divine hierarchy and all that. And each realm is ruled by a supreme deity, just as the realm is ruled by Zeno. But there's actually an exception to all this. Picon says that many years ago, before any of them existed, one of the supreme deities called Zarat 
who was very greedy, wanted to expand his domains. He wanted to conquer another realm. As Zeno's kingdom was the weakest among all, Zara decided to attack there with his hordes. But Goku wonders, shouldn't it have been easy to defeat him? Zeno can erase everything and everyone without difficulty. Why didn't he erase Zarat and his soldiers? But it wasn't that simple. Pecan explained that Zeno's absolute power to erase all things only works in his own realm and only to those who belong to his realm. He cannot do this to anything or anyone belonging to another realm, especially against the supreme deity. In short, Zeno is really absolute in his own realm for being able to erase everything and everyone as he pleases. But he has no martial skills, and so he was completely vulnerable to Zarat, who unlike him, possessed unimaginable abilities. Pecan says it was a very difficult war, but with the help of the other realms, Zeno's realm was able to repel Zarat's attack, and he was sealed and his power was divided into five very powerful creatures called the Five Primordial Beasts. And each one of these beasts has powers superior to the gods of destruction. These beasts were divided and hidden throughout the Zeno realm universes. Goku is surprised again. Are there other beings in the universes besides the angels and Zeno that surpass the gods of destruction so much? And then he asked Beerus if he knew all that. Beerus says yes, he has vast knowledge about all that, but Licker noticed the lie. Pecan continues with the story saying that after Zarat was sealed, his realm without the presence of a supreme deity became a great chaos. Wanting to solve this problem, the five great celestial mages, who were the most powerful gods in the realm of Zarat, decided to restore balance by bringing Zarat back. And so they invaded Zeno's realm, creating a war to collect cocoons of the five primordial beasts. But this time, Zeno's realm was much more organized, and all the gods of all the universes fought together against the celestial mages and managed to seal them away. Jin interrupts the explanation, telling Pecan not to be modest. That's because according to the story, he was mainly responsible for the victory against the celestial mages. This impresses Goku. Pecan is apparently really very powerful. Pecan tells them to ignore the details so they don't waste time. Bell Mod agrees not wasting time was a good idea. It was nice to remember the history classes, but it was time for Pecan to explain why he was there. Then Pecan finally says, the celestial mages have been freed. All the gods of destruction are absolutely shocked by this news. Arak questions Pecan whether the celestial mages under the watch of the celestial guardians. Pecan confirms, but recently the celestial guardians were attacked in a moment of weakness, which resulted in the death of the previous master, Anzen, and also the release of the celestial mages. Beerus is suspicious about that moment of weakness? This smells like betrayal, and that means Pecan's group isn't that reliable at the moment. Pecan agreed that there is an enemy infiltrator in the celestial world, and not even they, the celestial guardians, are completely trustworthy. Goku is completely lost. Celestial world? Celestial guardians? What is all this? But Beerus tells him to shut up. Nobody wants to explain everything to him. But Likir unmasks the destroyer of Universe 7. He's only saying that because he doesn't know very well either. Apparently Beerus is not the most studious among the gods which is expected of him. Iwan says that from what Pecan is saying, the celestial mages escape doesn't seem to have been that recent. Why is it just now that this news is being given? Pecan justifies it by saying after the mages escaped, there was no way to be sure where they had gone. And he did not want to worry the other realms unnecessarily with speculation. But the truth is that they, the guardians, had hoped to find mages before the news got out. But recently they got confirmation that the mages were in Zeno's realm. That's because Zeno was kidnapped and the super dragon balls were destroyed. This was an act of war. Kutella, very angry, scolds Beerus. How did he let all that happen in his universe? But the destroyer justifies it by saying that the universe is so big. Goku remembers that there were also orbs in his universe. Could it be that the enemies were there and he didn't notice? But Pecan says there's no time for discussion. Now that the celestial mages have Zuno, they will discover the location of the five primordial beast cocoons. And that cannot happen. There are two beasts in universe 7, one in universe 6, one in universe 8, and one in universe 11. All gods who have a beast in their territory need to find the cocoons immediately. Hellas asks what should the gods do who don't have any beasts in their universes? Pecan says that they must also return to their universes as the angels are in a meeting with the Grand Priest who gathered them all after he, Pecan, explained the situation. That is, at this moment, the universe is very vulnerable and that is why it is important that the destroyers return. Beerus tells them to stop stalling and do what they're supposed to do. Before they go, one last warning especially to the gods who will go after the cocoons. It is possible that they will be attacked by the celestial mages, so they must be prepared for an extremely dangerous combat. This strangely cheers up Goku, and after the last warning from the Master of the Celestial Guardians, everyone leaves towards their respective universes. The chapter begins in a mysterious castle situated in a forgotten dimension of the multiverse. Someone screams inside the castle. 
damn. Inside the castle are gathered five people, the five great celestial mages. The person who yelled is anxious. She taps her finger on the table to control her anxiety. Then she gives up and slams her hand on the table and then addresses the person next to her saying that she, Brajin, is an incompetent. And she asks what Brajin did to him. Brajin is the same person who kidnapped Zuno, and she assures him she didn't do anything to him. A memory showing the moment of the capture of the omniscient creature from Universe 7 appears. Zuno is face to face with the creature that belongs to Brajin, and the creature roars next to him. Zuno is thrown by the monster's roar, hits his head on a pillar and passes out. But Brajin assures her that her pet only wanted to scare Zuno, but he was so weak she didn't mean any harm. Tyra says her companion was an idiot. If Zuno was okay, the beast would already be with them, but now the situation has given the enemies time to act. The mysterious man who is apparently the leader of the group warns, Zuno just woke up, and since Brajin and Tyra are so worried about the situation, they should go get the necessary information from him. The two look at who gave the order, and apparently there have been some respect and fear for that person. Zuno is trapped in the castle's dungeon, and from the shadows comes Tyra, who asks if he knows why they are there. Zuno says that he knows. They want information about the five great primordial beasts. Tyra creates an energy blade in her hand and threatens Zuno. Now he's going to say everything he knows. But after thinking for a few seconds, he gives his answer, no. And this answer leaves her very shocked. Zuno explains that he won't say anything until someone kisses him, preferably someone handsome. Tyra gets very angry. Does this bastard know who he's talking to? Is he not afraid to die? Zuno says that after Frieza threatened him for information, he felt very bad for his cowardice. And after that, he dedicated himself to intense mental training to no longer fear death. Threats will no longer work against him. Besides, if they kill him, they'll never get what they want. Tyra raises her blade. She's going to teach him a lesson, but Brajan intervenes, flinging her companion away. If a kiss is what the chubby guy wants, she'll give it to him, even because she loves fluffy cheeks. But it's not exactly what Zuno wants. He doesn't want a kiss from someone that's ugly. Brajan is very hurt by that. Why did he call her a demon? It's not her fault if she only had that thing to use. Tyra now wants to join in the fun too. She throws Brajan away, throws part of her clothes to the floor and shows off her feminine attributes, stating that she can be wild in other ways too. She kisses Zuno and asks him how he feels about receiving a kiss from a goddess. Zuno thinks about it and then he gives the result of the divine kiss. Two questions. Tyra is shocked by that. Is he kidding? But no, he's not kidding. With that answer, she has just one more question. What? Did that count as a question? And yes, that counted as a question. And now the two questions from Tyra, who doesn't take the situation very well, are over. But that situation is interrupted by a third person who mocks the two champions saying that they are two amateurs. He'll show you how to deal with someone like him. This man points his hand at Zuno and accumulates energy. Tyra and Brajan are worried. Is he going to do that? A light can be seen. Zuno screams, and when he opens his eyes, he got a harem. Enraptured by the beautiful women kissing him, Zuno gives his answer. They can do a hundred, no, a thousand questions. But apparently, that only happened in its mind. An illusion. Tyra and Brajan are shocked. While the third mage smiles and brags, no one is better at it than he is. After the meeting of the 12 Gods of Destruction, where the leader of the Celestial Guardians gave all the deities a quest, they return to their respective universes to collect the cocoons of the five great primordial beasts or prepare for a possible battle. In Universe 7, Beerus and Pecan fly through space. Beerus is clearly not very pleased with this situation and asks why among so many universes the Guardian wanted to go to his universe right away. Pecan explains that he thinks Universe 7 deserves special attention. That's where Zuno and the Super Dragon Balls were, and there are also two primordial beasts there. It was also this universe that the mages attacked first, and they will probably pay special attention to this universe, as it was the universe that won the Tournament of Power and became the most outstanding among them all. But then Pecan reveals that in addition to the logical reasons, there is also a sentimental reason. This universe was the one he ruled over. This surprises Beerus. Was Pecan once the god of this universe? The head of the Celestial Guardians confirmed he was the first god of destruction of Universe 7. He was the master of Taron, the master of Beerus. 
Pecan continues talking to Beerus, saying that maybe Whis talked about him. After all, he was the one who trained him. Beerus starts to remember on second thought. Pecan's name sounded familiar to him, but he couldn't remember very well. The current destroyer is scolded by his predecessor, who says that Beerus should be more aware of the history of his universe, and knowing the gods that came before him was basic knowledge. This angers Beerus, who now believes more than ever that Pecan was Taron's master. After all, he's just as boring. Pecan not liking Beerus' attitude says that he is now confirming what Taron said. Beerus is a hardhead, but that information leaves Beerus confused. How did Taron talk about him to Pecan if, when he was born, Pecan was already dead for a long time? This question generates another rebuke for Beerus. He should be more attentive. Taron, like Pecan, was killed by a corrupted god. That means they were reunited after death. And also, Taron became a heavenly guardian too. They worked together all these years. With this speech from Pecan, we can conclude that gods who die at the hands of corrupted gods go to different place, probably to the celestial world that was mentioned in the last chapter. Continuing with the dialogue, Beerus asks how his master is doing. Dead, replies Pecan, saying that he died in the last attack, the celestial guardian suffered, just like almost all the other guardians. This information clearly saddens Beerus. In Dragon Ball, after a mortal dies, the body can be kept in the other world, but if it is killed again, it disappears completely. If this concept is repeated with dead gods, Taron and all the other celestial guardians can never be seen again. Meanwhile, in Universe 6, Goku arrives on his planet, despite the urgency of the situation. The Saiyan God is very excited, since apparently very powerful people will go to his universe. He will be able to face these people. All he needs to do is find this primordial beast, and Vados will help him do that. But there's a small problem with this plan. Vados is not there. What will Goku do now? He has no idea where the primordial beast cocoon is, and he doesn't know this universe very well yet. But then he has an idea. The Supreme Kai Li'ai can help. All he needs to do is go to her and ask for help. But there's a problem with that plan too. He doesn't know where the sacred planet of this universe is. But Goku starts to remember something. Vados has said something about this planet before. Some days before, Goku is thoughtful. He wonders how long it will take for him to become stronger than Beerus. But Goku's thoughts are interrupted by Vados who says he should pay attention because knowing the universe is very important. Goku is very sincere. He says he got distracted because the class was too boring. Seeing that her student wasn't exactly a studious genius, Vados decides to change the method and appeal to a more concise and visual explanation. She creates with her a staff, a hologram, showing the design of the globe of the universe. And this globe that Vados is showing is really the macroverse of Dragon Ball, detailed in official guides of the franchise. Vados explains that beneath everything on the globe is the Mai Kai world, the same world that Frieza and Cooler stole Janemba's cocoon from. Above the Mai Kai world is the world of the living, where Earth and all the other planets are. Above this world is the cosmos, or the other world. Is in the other world where the King Kai and Emma Dio lives, also is there where the Snake Way is, and also those things we saw when Goku was dead. Outside this globe revolving around it is the Kai dimension, and at the center of this dimension is the sacred planet of the Supreme Kais. According to Vados, the planet of destruction is also outside the globe, between the cosmos and the world of the living. And this last information is not information from official guides. It's a new concept of Dragon Ball Hakai. Never was explained in official guides where the planet of destruction is situated in the globe. Returning to the present moment, Goku now knows what to do. He just needs to focus on what's outside the globe. If he does, he'll be able to find Lei's energy more easily. Goku manages to find it, after which he thanks Vados for her teachings and disappears from the planet. Meanwhile, on the sacred planet, Lei is on the ground and Kiboru is standing before her with a sword in her hand. They are clearly training. Lei is determined and gets up to continue, but just as the two are about to cross swords again, Goku appears and, well, they're going to need new swords. Goku rubs his head. He says he didn't want to come suddenly like this, but then they didn't need to try to kill him. Lei yells at the destroyer. He shouldn't suddenly appear like this. He scared them away. Kiboru asks why Goku was there, and he responds saying he needs their help and it's urgent. Meanwhile, on Universe 7's Planet of Destruction, a large rock floats in the planet's sky and suddenly that rock is completely destroyed. Who did this was Vegeta, who is now controlling his Hakai much better. Suddenly, two people arrive on the planet. It's Beerus and Pecan. Beerus is surprised that Vegeta is already on his feet. Vegeta explains that when he woke up, he was already completely healed, so he decided to go back to training. 
This causes Beerus to smile, saying that Saiyans are really tough. Looking at Pecan, Vegeta in his thoughts notes that Pecan, despite not emanating energy, can feel that the monstrous power he has and his presence is even more intense than Beerus. Seeing Vegeta looking at Pecan, Beerus introduces the visitor and explains he has come to resolve some matters in this universe. Pecan so far hasn't said anything. He was looking for something he didn't find, and we found out he was looking for Whis. But apparently he was still at the Angel's meeting. That's a shame since he wanted to see the Angel. Vegeta Curious asks if he knows Whis. Pecan replies yes. He was the first god of destruction in this universe, and Whis was his master. The information surprises Vegeta. He's the first god of destruction? But Beerus interrupts the conversation by saying that they should get straight to what really matters. He asks what Pecan intends to do. Pecan tells his plan. They go after Janemba. This beast is in the possession of Frieza, a mortal from Universe 7, so he wants Beerus to deal with his own mortals. Vegeta listens to everything like a good gossip, thinks that Frieza was taking a long time to cause some trouble, but Beerus doesn't quite understand. Understand. If there are two primordial beasts in Universe 7, why do the two go after Janemba? Who goes after the same part of Majin Buu? And guys, for those who forgot, it was already informed in Dragon Ball Hakai that the Majin Buu we know is only a small fraction of Majin Buu's real power. Apparently, most of Buu's power is still locked in a cocoon, just like Janemba. Upon Beerus' question, Pecan says not to worry about Majin Buu. The Celestial Guardian deduced that the gods would cooperate, so he stepped forward and sent another guardian to take Majin Buu's cocoon. Pecan assures him he's in good hands. The manga cuts to another place in Universe 7, a place called Planet magma. Inside that planet, we can all see a big sea of volcanic lava, and out of that sea of lava emerges one of the Celestial Guardians, and he's carrying a cocoon that is probably Majin Buu's original cocoon. Meanwhile, back at the Planet of Destruction, we see that Beerus isn't so happy about it. He didn't like the idea of Pecan assuming his decisions and acting on his own. But something was strange. If someone else was already sent to get Majin Buu's cocoon, why did Pecan come with him? Wouldn't he keep one of the beasts just like Vermouth, Liquor, and Goku? When Beerus asks this, Vegeta discovers that Goku is also involved in this whole situation, as are the other gods. Poor Vegeta! Nobody explains anything to him! Pecan replies to Beerus that they they chose not to leave any of the beasts in Universe 7. That universe, as he already explained, will be targeted by mages for other reasons. So they want to reduce the nuisance. What's more, unfortunately it's well known that the destroyer of Universe 7 is a very negligent god. So taking Majin Buu and Janemba along is a safety issue too. The atmosphere becomes tense, and Beerus admits that he liked Pecan more when he couldn't remember who he was. Beerus puts his hand on the sash around his waist and tosses something to Vegeta. Looking at what it was, Vegeta sees that it was a earring. But what is it for? Beerus explains that Yuring is proof that he can use the power of a god of destruction. Using that, it's as if Vegeta represents him. This scene is a clear reference to Granola's arc where Beerus does the same thing after teaching Vegeta the Hawkeye. But Pecan doesn't understand that. Why was Beerus doing that? The Destroyer replies that Vegeta will carry out this mission in his place. This decision is disapproved by Pecan, who says that giving such an important job to a mortal is gross negligence. But Beerus asks what the surprise is. Isn't he known for being a careless god? Besides, Pecan is no longer the god of that universe. His time has passed. Now he's the one making the decisions, and he's decided to get some sleep. Beerus turns his back on the Guardian and says goodbye, telling Vegeta that he leaves everything in his hands. Meanwhile, Pecan criticizes him severely, stating that he is a disappointment, and not even half of what his master was. As Beerus leaves, Vegeta puts the earring in his ear and asks Pecan how he intends to get to Frieza. Pecan admits he doesn't know how to find him. When he saw Frieza on Zuno's planet, it was a coincidence. But if Vegeta knows him, he must know how to find him through Ki. Vegeta says that Frieza is definitely far from the planet. He could even take them to Frieza with the instant transmission, but there's no way to feel Frieza's energy from that place, even more if he's not releasing energy with intensity. But Pecan says he's going to help the Saiyan. He should just focus on Frieza's energy right now. Vegeta does so, and then the Guardian touches his shoulder, which makes the Prince very uncomfortable. Pecan tells him to calm down. He's just going to use an ability that will amplify Vegeta's senses, so he can find Frieza even if he's far away. Vegeta accepts, but he doesn't really like it. This guy is very inconvenient, but it worked! Vegeta found Frieza's key and then took them to the Emperor with the instant transmission. Planets Quinn. Vegeta and Pecan appear at the center of the Quintet Planets. Vegeta doesn't understand why they're there. They should have gone straight to where Frieza is. 
Pecan explains that Frieza is probably on a spaceship, and if they fight inside a ship, they would destroy the ship, and Janemba's cocoon could be harmed. Frieza's ship will pass by the planet soon, and considering the ship's path, the location was the most appropriate for a possible battle. Vegeta gets very angry about this. Did Pecan manipulate his senses to guide them somewhere else? He didn't like it, but Pecan tries to calm him down, justifying that if Janemba woke up in an aggressive way, Vegeta would understand his reasons. Vegeta says that since they have some time before Frieza arrives, this would be the perfect opportunity for Pecan to explain to him what's going on. It's okay for Pecan to explain, besides, this universe will be one of the main focuses of the Celestial Mages, and Vegeta will certainly be included in all this mess. It's fair that he understands understands what's going on. Meanwhile, in Universe 8, Licker is apparently succeeding in his mission. He carries the cocoon of the primordial beast that was in his universe. As he carries the cocoon, Licker in his thoughts says that it was difficult to convince those guardian pups to let him bring it. But it's not like they had a choice. After all, they couldn't oppose the god of destruction. These guardian pups Licker refers to are probably apprentices and are the trio of demons that faced Cooler and his men. If that's the case, in fact, they could never oppose a god of destruction. When Likir finally lands on his planet, someone calls him, complaining that he took too long. Likir immediately looks at some trees and orders that person to leave. The person jumps out of the trees. Looking at this person, Likir in thought notes that even without emanating energy, he can feel that she is someone extremely dangerous. The destroyer orders the invaders to present herself at once. She refers to him as the one who is known as one of the most intelligent and studious among the gods of this generation. So even though she's different now, can't he recognize the great war queen goddess of the realm of Zarat? After she says that, Likir finally recognizes her. She is Tyra, the great mage warrior. She's part of the group called the Five Great Celestial Mages. The mage congratulates the destroyer. He's right. But Likir isn't in any good mood as she is. After all, it's a great petulance for her to be in his universe, especially on his planet. She apologizes. She didn't mean to offend him, but they can sort this out really fast. He just needs to give her Hatch's cocoon and she's gone in an instant. With this, we discover that the primordial beast that is in Universe 8 is called Hatch. But Likir doesn't like the mage's idea, nor does he think he's going to hand over Hatch. And then the destroyer of Universe 8 makes his combat stance. Tyra is not opposed to this idea. She licks her lips in excitement. Meanwhile, on planet Earth of Universe 7, in some desert on the planet, Oob appears. He's running from a dinosaur, and he's got a barrel on his back. But someone is watching this from the top of a rock, and that person, when given the opportunity, lunges at the dinosaur with a kick, which is enough to defeat the monster. That person is King Chapa, whom Oob refers to as Master Chapa. That is, King Chapa is the master of the boy Oob. For those who don't know, there is official information stating this, that Chapa is the one who trains Oob, which is why the boy knew martial arts when he fought Goku in the tournament at the end of Dragon Ball Z. Anyway, Chapa scolds Oob. He could easily run away from that creature if he hadn't been carrying that bottle of water. He shouldn't take unnecessary risks. Oob justifies that he wanted to bring some water to his people. He wanted to be able to relieve them. But Chapa, while patting his disciples' head, says that he understands Oob's reason. But he is very strong and will surely be the one who will bring prosperity to his people in the future. That's why Chapa is training him. But their conversation is interrupted when another creature appears. This time, even Chapa is startled by the creature's size. Is it the other's mother? The great dinosaur roars, and the roar of the beast is fierce. But Oob, in a moment of fear, reaches out of the creature, and then he accidentally releases a huge wave of energy that simply rips the monster into pieces. Oob himself is very frightened by what he has done, looking down at his hands in amazement. But Chapa doesn't share the boy's surprise. He knew that Oob was very special, and he was an extremely kind and gentle heart, much like someone he faced many years ago. This person Chapa refers to as Goku, as he faced Goku when the protagonist was just a child. But another problem arises. Someone mysterious says that Oob did very well, and would have been very inconvenient if he dies. Whoever says that is a person with a face completely covered, but by the clothes he's wearing, one can tell he's one of the celestial mages. Chapa asks who he is. He seems to be a suspicious guy, but the mage tells him to get away. He doesn't have time for trash. Chapa assures him he won't say that in a few seconds, and then he lunges at the mage, but he suddenly feels something and falls to the ground. 
board, the mage says that he couldn't even get close. If he had boosted his energy even a little, the earthling would have been torn to pieces. Oob screams desperately for his master as he runs towards him, but is startled when the mage rushes in front of him with incredible speed. The mage extends his hand to capture Oob, saying that the boy will go with him. But to everyone's surprise, a hand grabs the intruder's wrist. Beerus appears. The mage smiles. He was very skilled at getting so close without being noticed. Beerus the Destroyer, the god of destruction with a serious expression, tells him not to get too excited. Now the invader will have to deal with him directly. Meanwhile, on the planet Quinn, Pecan has just explained to Vegeta the whole situation. Vegeta now understands what's going on, but asks why they don't use the Super Dragon Balls to solve this whole situation, as these orbs can grant literally any wish. Pecan says it would be great to have that option, but the Super Dragon Balls were destroyed. Now neither the Super Dragon Balls nor any other Dragon Balls can be used, as the smaller orbs were connected to the larger orbs. Vegeta is very worried about that information. Will the Earth Dragon Balls also stop working? For those who don't know, the smaller Dragon Balls made by the Namekians are created from fragments of the Super Dragon Balls, meaning the smaller orbs are literally parts of the larger orbs, so it makes sense that they wouldn't work with the destruction of the larger ones. Pecan notices something. He says that they don't have time to talk anymore. Frieza is approaching. Only after the Celestial Guardian says this does Vegeta realize, the Saiyan says he'll wait for the villain to get a little closer to call him to the party. Meanwhile, Frieza's ship is moving fastly through space. Frieza is watching Janemba's cocoon. He's apparently quite dissatisfied. Cooler approaches his younger brother, asking what he intends to do about that thing. That was probably what Frieza was thinking. Frieza admits that at first he didn't think dealing with that cocoon would be so complex. In his opinion, there was only one option, a more aggressive approach. Cooler asks if his brother is sure about this. He himself says that creature was very powerful, and if Janemba becomes unstable, they could be in trouble. Frieza explains that he knew from the start that they might have a hard time dealing with Janemba. So, Kekono all this time had been working on a special super tech caller far more powerful than the one used to keep Brawly in check. Cooler says he won't be cowed either way. If the only way to free Janemba is the hard way, so be it. They just need to find a suitable place to do this. Suddenly, the ship shudders. Frieza surprise asks what's happened. Kikono fiddling with the ship's computer informs Frieza that a shot was fired near them and that he's going to look for where it came from. Kikono quickly finds the source of the shot and shows it to Frieza through a hologram. Frieza recognizes Vegeta but wonders who that person is with him. Cooler recognizes that name and asks if this guy Vegeta isn't one of the Saiyans Frieza said had surpassed him and also the last member of the Saiyans royal bloodline. Frieza confirms and says he's probably there to stop his plans. Cooler gets angry and says this is their opportunity to eliminate that worm. Frieza equally angry agrees. He asks Kikono where Vegeta is. Kikono says he's on a quintet of planets called Planets Quint, not far from there. Frieza says they are going to fly and asks Kikono to keep his distance, but for him to approach the ship discreetly in case they need any assistance. After giving these instructions to Kikono, Frieza looks at Linzur, who notices the Emperor's signal. Cooler and Frieza fly to the planet's Quinn. As soon as he sees them land, Vegeta recognizes that person accompanying Frieza as someone of the same race as him and Cold. Frieza greets Vegeta with a fake smile, saying it is a displeasure to see him again. He also asks what the Saiyan Prince wants with him. The answer comes from Pecan, who demands that Frieza deliver Janemba to them immediately. He do this in name of the Celestial Guardians, and if Frieza doesn't do as he orders, Pecan will have to use force. But Frieza is not intimidated. Celestial Guardians Guardians? Wasn't this the same group as those three worms that were guarding Janemba? But Vegeta advises Frieza to choose his enemies wisely. This man was once a god of destruction and he might have the same level of power as Beerus. Or maybe he's even more powerful. The information really shocks Frieza, a god of destruction who might be more powerful than Beerus. Cooler asks his brother to keep his composure so he doesn't embarrass their family. Besides, they've trained a lot lately and their power has grown a lot. He's sure they can win, but Frieza disagrees. Cooler doesn't understand. This is a battle they definitely can't win. Upon hearing that name, Vegeta recognizes him and is very surprised. In thought, Frieza reflects that Cooler hasn't yet seen the power of a god of destruction, so he doesn't have much sense of the danger they're in. There is only one way for him to be unharmed from the situation. He apologizes to his older brother, but he will have to dispose of him sooner than expected. Frieza suddenly screams for Linzur. The ship was already close to the planet, as Frieza instructed Kikono. Linzur hears the Emperor's call, and so he teleports to the planet. Touching Frieza, he takes the Emperor back to the ship, leaving everyone shocked. 
especially cooler. Frieza orders Kikona to get them out of there immediately, and he hastens to obey. The ship leaves at great speed, and Cooler, seeing that he has been betrayed, curses his brother. Pecan addressing to Vegeta says that the important thing is Janemba's cocoon. They must follow Frieza and leave Cooler behind. But Vegeta refuses. He will stay and face Cooler. Pecan has apparently already learned Frieza's key and seems to have a great sense. He might as well go after the fugitive. Vegeta says that no matter what, Pecan must not intervene in this fight or he will not forgive him. Pecan says that Saiyans are all the same and he knows someone like him. Here he's probably talking about that Saiyan we saw in the last chapter. Pecan says he will go after Frieza, but even if he returns before the fight is over, he won't interfere and the combat is a promise. Cooler looks at Pecan leaving, but Vegeta calls out to him, and the two face each other. Vegeta says that Cooler will have to deal with him. In the quintet of planets called Planet Quinn, Vegeta and Cooler face each other. Cooler is warming up for the fight, while Vegeta watches him with his hand resting on his waist. The Prince of the Saiyans who apparently had heard legends about Cooler says, So, you're the legendary Cooler. I wasn't born at the time of your fall, but my father told me a lot about you. The one who was so powerful that even Frieza and Cold feared you. It is said that not even the two of them together could defeat you. So they created a trap to take you down. Cooler is happy to hear that Vegeta knows who he is. And as he continues to warm up his body, he says, I'm glad that even ignorant people like you Saiyans kept the respect I deserve. Be grateful that Cold and Frieza betrayed me, because if it wasn't for them, you wouldn't have escaped complete extinction, because I would have wiped you all out. While hearing these words from Cooler, Vegeta stared at him seriously. Frieza's brother continued with his speech, But now that I'm free again, I'm going to complete the job those idiots were incapable of. Hearing this, Vegeta gets angry, and while clenching his fist tightly, he says, Do you think you can? Don't think things are like the old days. Who will be eliminated is you. And by me! Vegeta releases his energy in the form of the Super Saiyan's flaming aura. And while doing this, he points his fingers at himself and completes the sentence by introducing himself. The Prince of the Saiyans, the Great Vegeta. Seeing Vegeta's transformation cooler seems to recognize that form. And then he says, that blonde hair transformation. Frieza mentioned that. That's the Super Saiyan, right? Your first transformation after the one you turned into monkeys. Vegeta confirms Cooler's doubts by saying, Exactly. That's how Kakarot defeated Frieza the first time. And while increasing his energy even more, Vegeta concludes, This is the first stage of Super Saiyan power. Cooler is apparently offended by that transformation and complains saying, is this the first stage you intend to face me with? Who do you think I am? The prince answers that question with a provocative tone and says, If you want to see more of my powers, you need to show that you're worthy, don't you think? Those words make Cooler furious, and he prepares a blow. He yells, You damn monkey, put yourself in your shoes. Cooler lands a punch on Vegeta, and even though Vegeta blocks the attack with his arms, the pressure of the blow goes through the Saiyan's body and makes him spill some blood from his mouth. And while surprised by that blow, Vegeta thinks, What a power! If I hadn't increased my strength and resistance by turning into Super Saiyan 2 at the exact moment of the blow, I would have been killed by that power. But Cooler doesn't intend to give Vegeta time to think. And he goes on to the Saiyan's back, preparing a second attack. He scolds his opponent, saying, Don't get distracted. Vegeta, while crouching to dodge Cooler's blow, transforms into a Super Saiyan God. Apparently, he needs to transform to have enough speed not to be hit by the blow. As he dodges the attack, he thinks, My body still doesn't have enough speed to keep up with him in this form. While crouching, Vegeta notices a strand of hair falling from his head. Which means that even transforming into a Super Saiyan God to dodge, he barely escaped Cooler's blow. While still crouching, Vegeta counters Cooler with a kick, knocking the enemy away. As he lands on the ground again, Cooler, no doubt speaking ironically, says, Well, well, it looks like I'm worthy of seeing your transformations. Annoyed, Vegeta says, Don't brag. This is far from my most powerful form. After saying that, while facing the opponent, Vegeta thinks, Cooler's punches are not like Frieza's punches. They're much more accurate and deadly. I already imagined that if he was training with Frieza, his powers weren't like they were in the past. But is he already at that level? I thought that if I provoked him, he would be able to find a gap and kill him quickly. But even angry, he is able to calculate very well what he does. He is really different from Frieza. He is much more lethal in his movements and tactics. I need to be more careful or else he can kill me on the first slip. As Vegeta thinks about Cooler's dangerousness, Frieza's older brother yells, Prepare to die, Saiyan, with a serious expression, no doubt taking his opponent a lot more seriously now. 
Vegeta does his fighting stance. This fight would certainly not be any fight. Meanwhile, on Universe 8's Planet of Destruction, Licker faces Tyra. The Destroyer is already in his fight stance, but the mage looks a little more relaxed, smiling as she looks at him. Seemingly speaking with irony, she says that the Hakaishans are too dramatic. Likir could just hand over Hatch and let her go. There's no need to die because of it. But Likir, in a much less patient mood, tells her to shut up. She must not underestimate a god of destruction. But Tyra laughs at the Universe 8 Destroyer's fury and then takes a much more relaxed fighting stance. Likir runs towards the mage and reaching her tries an attack. But Tyra disappears at high speed in front of him. Only then does Likir realize that she is already flying towards Hatch's cocoon. And the speed of the goddess from the other realm surprises him. Likir grows three more tails from his body, and now with six tails, the destroyer screams that he won't let her do that. When she is very close to touching the cocoon, Tyra realizes that Likir is already behind her, and so the fox god passes right by her, but does so by capturing the woman's ankle with one of his tails, and so he begins to carry her away from the cocoon while suggesting they fight in a more suitable location. In an instant, they are already leaving the planet, going into space. As this happens, Tyra, with an oddly calm expression, notes the fact that Likir has become faster by releasing more tails. So we can conclude that his power increases according to the number of tails released. When he decides he's gone far enough, Likir launches Tyra away using his tail and then to drive her even further away using his hands to release a telekinetic force that launches her even further, causing the warrior goddess to crash into a celestial body, which seems to cause her some pain. After doing this, Likir finishes releasing his tails, and now with the nine tails released, he concentrates a large amount of power and launches a powerful globe of energy at the opponent, completely destroying that celestial body. Likir wonders if he made it, but the answer comes soon after when Tyra comes out of the rubble and tries to launch a punch on him. Such a punch that Likir defends using his hand, but the destroyer didn't come out unscathed from the blow. His hand spills blood. Looking at the bloodied hand, Likir admits that thinking this fight would be won so quickly was too good to be true. Tyra, with a savage smile on her face, says that if the Destroyer wants to fight, they can fight a little. On Universe 6's Supreme Planet, Goku explains to Kiboru and Liai the reason for his sudden visit. He needs help finding someone called Primordial Beast, and he needs to do it fast. But he doesn't know much about this universe, and Vados is not with him. He asks if they can help him. Liai apologizes to Goku. She doesn't know anything about it. She's a rookie goddess too, and just like him, she's still learning. Kiboru, who is the veteran god in that place, says that he doesn't know much about it either. This matter involving the primordial beast is very old, and it has been many generations of Super Kai since those events. Goku is disappointed to hear this, so he also doesn't know where this thing is. Kiboru replies no, but he gives one hope. He can look it up in the Book of the Universe. This book contains the entire history of their universe, and it will surely have some information about the primordial beast called Hiro. This cheers Goku, who thanks the Supreme Kai's assistant. Kiboru holds out his hand as he releases magical energy, and then a huge book appears in front of him. A book so large that it sinks to the ground as it falls. Seeing this book, Goku is a little worried. Kiboru won't need to read all that, right? But the answer is disheartening. That's just the first book out of a hundred. This information knocks Goku down, literally. In Universe 8's Southern Galaxy, Likir and Tyra fly through space, clashing many times, until they finally fly towards each other for a head-on collision. And they do this by clashing their fists, creating such a powerful impact wave that destroys a celestial body close to them. After the clash between them, Tyra tries to punch Likir, but he dodges the attack, and using one of his tails, lands a blow on the woman, who is knocked away by the blow. And after doing so, Likir concentrates energy on his tails and launches a string of attacks against her. Tyra ends up only in the Northern Galaxy, crashing violently into another celestial body which is destroyed in the process. After receiving so many attacks, Tyra is a little frustrated. It sucks to fight with that body limiting her. But what does she mean by that? Likir with a teasing smile reveals that after all the legends he's ever heard, he expected more from a celestial mage. Annoyed? Tyra responds to this taunt by creating an energy blade and saying that if that's the case, she can show him more. She reminds the destroyer that she is called the Great Mage Warrior, probably meaning that using weapons is her speciality. But Likir isn't too impressed with that. For him, that's not a big deal. After all, he can also create a keyblade, 
Kiboru uses his psychic powers to flip quickly through the book of the universe while using his Supreme Kai's enhanced senses to read the book at great speed. And considering the other books next to him, this is already the third volume. Meanwhile, Goku is finishing explaining the whole situation to them, ending the news by saying that the Celestial Mage wants to catch the Primordial Beasts, and as a destroyer, he has to stop this and fight them. Lei is excited about this situation. She didn't expect that in such a short time as a goddess, she would already have some action, especially something of this level. But Kiboru warns Lei that she shouldn't even think about it. The Celestial Mages are no opponents for beings like them. And Kiboru goes even further in his statement, saying that in fact not even a god of destruction can defeat them. This statement worries Goku a little. Is what he's saying true? Not even a god of destruction can defeat them? Kiboru confirms, yes, it's true. And then as we see Likir and Taira continuing their confrontation, Kiboru explains some of the backstory to Goku. Kiboru says, After the supreme deity Zarat attacked Zeno's realm and was unsuccessful, he was sealed away here. The main gods of the realm of Zarat, the celestial mages organized powerful military hordes and attacked the Zeno realm. At that time, gods and mortals fought side by side to defend this entire multiverse. But the enemy commanders were the five great celestial mages, and they were extremely powerful beings. At that moment in the fight, Lakir seems to have more difficulties in his combat, and Tyra advances against him while the destroyer, cornered, waits for the attack. Tyra attacks the Hakaishin, who can only dodge. Meanwhile, Kiboru continues, The strength, speed, and endurance of these beings were unreal, even for the god of destruction. Tyra sees a gap in Lakir, and then she launches a strong attack, and the Celestial Mage's attack destroys the God of Destruction's energy blade, and also wounds him. And as it happens, Kiboru says, But that's not all that made them so powerful. Lakir stares at his own wound burning his chest, but the Destroyer immediately responds to the attack by grabbing Tyra's arm. But he immobilized not only the arm that held the blade, but also her other arm and legs, leaving her immobilized. Or at least, that's what he thought. Tyra creates a shuriken in her hand. As she does, Kiboru says, In addition to being extremely powerful in the literal sense of the word, the Celestial Mages have powerful spells that make them even more formidable opponents. Kiboru's words prove to be true the very moment they are spoken, as Tyra manipulating the shuriken cuts off Likir's tail, causing the destroyer of Universe 8 great pain. And then Kiboru, while leafing through the fifth book, continues his explanation to Goku and Liai, who are listening intently like students in a class. Kiboru says, At that time, there were 18 universes in Zeno's realm, so there were 18 gods of destruction. But despite the numerical disadvantage, the Celestial Mages managed to fight in balance with the Hakaishans. This means that at that time, a Celestial Mage averaged the power level of four gods of destruction. And it is said that the destroyers of the first generation were on average more powerful than the destroyers of this generation. In short, a destroyer currently cannot single-handedly defeat a celestial mage. Lei is surprised hearing this. She heard that a god of destruction is very powerful. And she also concludes that probably Goku can't defeat a celestial mage either. And she says that she notices that Goku is apparently saddened. She regrets what she said and tries to comfort her companion telling him not to be like this. But suddenly Goku smiles, and as he clashes his fists with joy, exclaims that he's going to get even stronger fighting these guys. This attitude of him leaves Liai very surprised. Sharing Goku's excitement, she praises the fact that he doesn't get discouraged with little things. Goku agrees with her. Of course, he can't get discouraged easily. Besides, the person he wants to overcome right now is very tough. So if he gets discouraged with any obstacle, he would have given up a long time ago. Liai is curious and asks him who this person is. He must be an amazing guy. Something is thrown with great force against the planet of destruction of Universe 8, advancing at high speed towards the planet and crashing violently against the ground. It is Likir who after the impact touches his aching body while complaining about his enemy's great power and that the difference in power between them has suddenly become too great. After complaining about it, the destroyer stands up, ready for more far away. Tyra launches an energy attack that she calls the Celestial Bow. On the planet, Lakir, while preparing to do something in his thoughts, states that he didn't want to put the universe at risk. But with the gravity of this situation, he needs to unleash his maximum power as a god of destruction. But then, something shines in the sky. It's something that's heading towards the destroyer. Seeing an extremely powerful attack coming towards him, Likir opens his mouth in an expression of fear, and Tyra's attack passes through the planet of destruction, cutting that tough planet in half like butter. What happened to Likir? 
was he hit by that attack? On planet Earth in Universe 7 in a large, dry, empty field, Beerus continues his confrontation with the strange man who tried to capture Oob. Meanwhile, the boy carries his knocked-out master, King Chapa, behind a large boulder. Arriving at this makeshift hideout, Oob wonders who these guys are. He senses a very bad thing coming from them. The mystery man, while facing Beerus, admits he didn't expect to show up at that moment. Beerus replies that he figured that if they wanted the power of the five great primordial beasts, and that includes Mai Jin Bu's power, they would come after the small parts of his power that have already been released. Surely Beerus is referring to Fat Bu and Oob. After listening to Beerus' reasoning, the maid says that he is smarter than everyone says. The destroyer of Universe 7 replies that the invader would be even smarter if he cooperated by telling him everything he wants to know. If he doesn't, they'll have to try the hard way. The man apologizes and says that this was not the time to face a god of Beerus' level. Beerus doesn't like that answer. After all, it's not like the invader has any choice. The man points his hand at Beerus and then shoots a large wave of energy that completely hits and even passes through the god of Universe 7's body. And that same energy goes towards the stone that Oob is hiding in. And while seeing this, the boy screams in terror. The attack hits the stone and completely destroys it, knocking Oob and King Chapa away. But despite all that, Beerus received the attack and remained unharmed, holding his opponent's hand while smiling. And then the destroyer takes the invader's hand away from his face. And the force of that move from Beerus creates a current of air that removes the hood that hid the enemy's head and face. And as he finally reveals his face, the invader praises the destroyer. Louder says, Agile as always, Beerus. Seeing the face that was before him, Beerus is shocked recognizing him as Master Tehran, and remembers moments of his childhood with this person, apparently very happy moments. Noticing Beerus's distraction, the enemy smiles, and then points one of his hands towards the sky, creating a magical rune above them. Beerus sees this power and realizes it was dangerous to remain close to the enemy. He leaps away. At the same moment, the magic rune falls towards the mage, and while this happens, the enemy, that is apparently Tehran, says goodbye to Beerus, who receives this farewell with an annoyed expression. The magic rune falls on the invader, and at the same moment, he disappears, after helplessly watching the enemy flee. Beerus can only lament, saying, Damn it! I got distracted and he got away! A ship cut through space at great speed. It was Frieza's spaceship. Inside the ship, Kikono and Barry Blue are in the control room with Frieza. The two servants control the ship while the Emperor watches them. The door to the room opens and those who enter are the members of Cooler Special Forces, Captain Salza, Nays, and Dore. Cooler soldiers have a disapproving expression, and Captain Salza questions Frieza, saying they're not finding Cooler. Frieza abandoned him on the battlefield? Frieza responds by saying that Cooler can take care of himself. And after the reply, a threat, saying they better not piss him off, or he'll kill them. This scares the three soldiers who, despite clearly disapproving Frieza's actions very much, are afraid to question him for the love of life. Barry Blue cuts through the tense atmosphere with good news. Barry Blue says, Good news, sir. Our super radar has been turned on, and it is not detecting any powerful presence in at least a third of the galaxy. Frieza hears this news with a satisfied smile. It won't be today that his plans will be ruined, but their joy is short-lived when the radar starts to alert them of something. Barry Blue warns that a powerful presence has suddenly appeared, and it's approaching them at unbelievable speed. Frieza, with an expression of despair, shouts an order to his subordinate. Kikono, activate maximum speed. Kikono receives that order with concern, giving the following warning to his lord. But great Frieza, if we reach the maximum speed, it's possible that the ship won't support for a long time. But Frieza apparently has bigger concerns, desperately screaming for his servant to obey. Kikono doesn't waste another second in obeying his lord. Pressing hard on the button on the ship's control, the maximum speed button. The ship's speed increases dramatically and the power generated by this sudden increase in speed knocks out even the three elite soldiers present at the scene, in addition to Linzur. But apparently even that wasn't enough. And according to Barry Blue, the pursuer continues to approach quickly. Kikono can't believe what's happening. This shouldn't be possible. Nothing in the universe should be faster than this ship. Seeing that the ship's high speed alone would be enough for his escape, Frieza heads to Linzor, ordering the Yard Rat to teleport the ship to the farthest location he knows no matter where. The Yard Rat was about to obey. The escape would be successful in an instant, but suddenly something shakes the ship, causing everyone to lose their balance for a brief moment. Frieza asks what's happening. At the top of the ship, he sees that the Pursuer has finally reached them. This news is given by Barry Blue, who warns the Emperor that he is there. Frieza is very frustrated and angry. Now that he's touching the ship, even if the teleport were done, 
he would be carried along with them. There's no other way to handle this situation. The ship's speed seems to stabilize again, and Pycon notices something. The roof of the ship opens and in the next moment, Frieza is floating out as he faces his pursuer. The Emperor says that if he insists so much, he will finally see the full power of the Great Frieza. In the sky of the planet's Quinn, an intense exchange of blows takes place. The combatants exchange blows so fast, they can barely be seen. Vegeta transformed into a Super Saiyan God, fights Cooler while still in base form. The Prince of the Saiyans dodges a punch from Cooler, who seems to have a little difficulty in this exchange of blows. Vegeta pressures Cooler with a few punches and then prepares a strong punch, hitting the opponent in the face and pushing him away. Cooler spins in the air to land safely on the ground as Vegeta descends from the sky towards him to continue attacking. But Cooler surprises the Saiyan by hitting him with his tail, knocking him away. And after launching Vegeta towards the sky again, Cooler jumps towards him grabs the prince's ankle and launches Vegeta towards the ground, causing the Saiyan to slam hard against the ground. After doing so, Cooler completes his string of attacks by focusing energy into the eyes and then launches energy lasers against the enemy. When Cooler's lasers hits the ground, it crosses the entire planet, creating a large fissure in the center of the planet that even from space can be seen very well. Fortunately, Vegeta dodged that attack and is standing beside the large fissure in the ground opened up by Cooler's lasers looking at the danger he's just passed. Looking at the enemy staring at him from the sky, Vegeta says, Bastard, I'll kill you! Vegeta launches himself towards Cooler at high speed, who yells at the oncoming enemy, You want to attack me head on, you worm? So come! But in thought, Cooler reflects on a strategy. Cooler thinks, instead of colliding my body with his, I'll quickly dodge at the last moment and hit a deadly point. That stupid wild Saiyan won't be able to predict this and will be defeated. Cooler charges towards Vegeta, but then, before they collide their bodies, Vegeta transforms into Super Saiyan Blue and somersaults in the air above Cooler, surprising him. In doing so, Vegeta grabs the opponent's tail with one hand and begins to spin him in the air. As it is rotated, Cooler shows his surprise. He transformed to get faster and dodged! Apparently, Cooler didn't think a savage could be smart either. After gaining a lot of strength by spinning the enemy, Vegeta throws him to the ground, causing Cooler to crash hard against the ground. And after the dust is dissipated, we can see that the fall has done great damage to the ground. And apparently the fall causes damage to Cooler as well, who is a little stunned after the last hit. Taking advantage of this bad moment of the enemy, Vegeta makes an attack stance and while concentrating energy he says, See you in hell, Cooler. Gallic gun! Vegeta launches a powerful attack. Seeing this, Cooler is worried. An extremely powerful and dangerous attack is coming. Outside, the planet can be seen the large amount of energy that was used in the technique. Vegeta's attack created a large crater in the planet's ground. The Saiyan floats above the spot trying to see what the result of his attack was. Seeing what happened, the Prince of the Saiyan smiles as he says, It's like I thought. It couldn't be that simple. Cooler is alive, and not only that, he's transformed and surrounded by a protective globe of energy that was surely what saved his life. Cooler yells, Damn you. That was dangerous. If I hadn't increased my powers with this transformation at the last second, I would have been ripped to shreds. After hearing his opponent's complaints, Vegeta responds with a sarcastic but obvious line. Oh, but that was the intention. Annoyed by the opponent's sarcasm, Cooler charges towards him completely furious. I will destroy you! On Universe 6's Supreme Planet, things were a little quieter, with Goku and Liai still waiting for the end of Kiboru's search for information about the primordial beast in the Book of the Universe. And paying attention to the amount of books around Supreme Kai's assistant, we see that the book he is currently reading is at least the seventh volume. But then Kiboru seems to finally find something relevant, stopping his reading at one of the pages of the book that contains an image very similar to the primordial beast cocoon. Goku, very frustrated and also in a great hurry, asks to the assistant to go faster. But in the next moment, Kiboru delivers the good news to the God of Destruction. He's found the location of the primordial beast that is in their universe. Hearing this, Goku clashes his fists in a sign of excitement, displaying an expression of joy and anxiety, certainly extremely excited about the future fights to come. Somewhere in Universe 6, Goku, Liai, and Kiboru teleport to a seemingly empty spot in space. Goku and Liai are very confused, and the protagonist expresses his feelings by saying that he thought they would go to the place where the primordial beast was, but they are in an empty place. But Kiboru tells him that they are actually in the right place. The Supreme Kai's assistant is heading towards somewhere, and suddenly he disappears in front of them. Confused, Goku asks Liai what happened, 
but she's no better than he is in the situation, saying he certainly shouldn't ask her. Even completely confused, they go ahead in the same way as Kiboru did, and in the same way that happened to him, they disappear. And suddenly, they are inside a planet. Goku and Lee are impressed by that. It's not every day you see something like this after all. Goku finds that very strange. There is nothing in front of them and suddenly they are on a planet. But Kiboru explains what is happening. This place is called Planet Chameleon. It is a special planet that hides its own presence from the rest of the universe. And this special characteristic was given by the Kaioshin who created this place, which was specially made to hide the primordial beast Hiru. After the brief explanation, Kiboru starts flying saying that they must go. They have no time to waste. As they fly towards the center of the planet, Goku comments that apparently the gods were very motivated not to let the primordial beast be found. He asks if these things are really that powerful. Kiboru responds by remembering about how he was telling them that celestial mages are very powerful, even surpassing the power of a god of destruction. And he adds that the power of a primordial beast goes far beyond that. He claims that the awakening of a primordial beast could mean the end of a universe as neither gods nor mortals can defeat these creatures. The Supreme Kai's assistant ends by saying that a primordial beast is the incarnation of the end of time. This statement makes Goku and Lei very worried. Meanwhile, in Universe 11, a battle was taking place that had destroyed approximately 180 solar systems. Belmod and Topo are very injured. They apparently face a very difficult battle. Blood drips from somewhere, or rather, from someone. Topo seeing this changes his astonished expression to an angry expression. But what is he seeing? They are looking at a strange creature which has, in its arms and foot, some members of the Pride Troopers. Crushed by the monster's foot is Kokore. With his chest torn apart by the creature's left arm is General Kashero. And in the right arm was being held Dispo's two broken legs, which had apparently been crushed by those powerful hands. Even in the face of all this brutality, the monster smiles at those who remain standing. This sight clearly shakes Topo, who is on his knees. The God of Destruction's apprentice curses the enemy, clenching his fist in all his wrath. Belmod, seeing what his disciple was about to do, tells him not to do that. He cannot be precipitate. But deafened by his fury, Topo ignores his master's orders and bolts towards the enemy. The creature launches Dispo at Topo to stop the warrior's advance. The force with which Dispo was thrown is superior to the force with which Topo charged, and so they are both thrown against a mountain while Belmod does nothing but watch. After doing this, the monster starts a slow and peaceful walk. It walks towards the God of Destruction of Universe 11, who is now completely lonely on the battlefield. As it approaches the Hakaishin, the creature sheds the extra weight by letting General Kasserol's dead body slide down its arm. Meanwhile, the monster asks the God, Tell me, Belmod, how could a god of destruction have been stupid enough to think that could challenge me with such mediocre creatures' help? Faced with that question, Belmod closes his eyes as he thinks. Belmod says, Damn it, all other pride troopers are dead, and Topo and Dispo are no longer able to fight. As it continues to approach and steps on the corpse of another pride soldier named Vuon, the monster asks the destroyer, What are you waiting for? Unleash your full power so I can kill you at once. Or do you intend to die using such a mediocre power level? After this question, Belmod reflects disappointment with himself. Belmod says, Damn it, what an idiot. I was to think I could face a primordial beast in that form. But I can't worry about the universe anymore. I need to use my power of my energy of destruction. But Belmod's thoughts are interrupted when he notices the arrival of someone that makes him very worried. Something approaches that devastates planet at high speed and lands on the planet violently causing destruction. That person is Jiren, who exudes an enormous amount of power while screaming with a great expression of fury at someone named Kalimor, who is surely that monster. Belmont is surprisingly not happy with Jiren's arrival. On the contrary, he's very worried about it, which is strange, since he should be happy that Universe 11's most powerful warrior arrived to help in that fight, right? But that brings up another question. Why wasn't Jiren helping the fight from the start? Who knows? Hey guys, with this scene we discovered that this monster is the primordial beast that lived in Universe 11, and this creature is called Kalimor, which for some reason, unlike the other primordial beasts we've seen so far, wasn't trapped in a cocoon, but in freedom. 
and apparently Jiren has some problem with this monster, as if he already knew this creature from somewhere. What will be Jiren's story with Calamore? Well, there are a few possibilities about that, but we leave that topic for another video. Now let's continue with the chapter. Universe 7, Planet Quinn. A lightning-fast battle takes place across the central planet of the Quinnet of Planets. Vegeta and Cooler fly higher and higher as they exchange blows. Vegeta attacks Cooler with a string of many attacks, while he just blocks the blows. The Saiyan makes his enemy retreat while throwing a large number of punches, and apparently he's putting a lot of effort into those attacks, hitting with everything he's got. But just one punch from Cooler is enough to stop Vegeta's attacks, who spills some blood from his mouth. But when wiping the blood, the Prince of Saiyan hides a smile. But that smile does not go unnoticed by Cooler, who while facing his opponent thinks, You don't fool me. I know you're still hiding power and must have at least one more transformation. But you want me to feel confident and let my guard down. So at the last moment, you increase your power and catch me off guard like you did before. But I won't fall in your little game. Vegeta charges at the opponent while wondering how the enemy will deal with the Super Saiyan Blue evolution. And then, while transforming to increase his power and get closer to Cooler, more quickly, Vegeta prepares a punch. But when he tries to hit the opponent who also charges at him, Cooler disappears. And then he reappears behind Vegeta saying that he has now caught him. Vegeta turns around in surprise to the enemy and then blood splatters. Cooler's hand is digging into the Saiyan's abdomen, who spills his warrior's blood from his mouth as he groans in pain. As he contemplates his opponent's suffering, Cooler comments, You idiot, you thought you'd catch me twice in the same trick. It was obvious that you were faking defeat to make me confident and make me let my guard down to once again increase your powers and catch me off guard. But to Cooler's surprise, Vegeta smiles and grabs his arm and then says, On the contrary, I knew someone as intelligent as you would notice such a plan. While pointing his hand at Cooler, he adds, What I wanted was to have you in the right place in front of me to hit you, an attack that will completely erase you from existence. While concentrating the power purple energy in his hand, the disciple of the God of Destruction shouts, Hawkeye vanishes forever. The powerful wave of energy completely engulfs Cooler's body, passing directly through him and out of the central planet towards another planet. When the energy hits that planet, it is completely destroying it, creating an immense explosion of light in the process. And all that's left of the big celestial body is a few flakes of light. While realizing the result of his attack, Vegeta smiles as he says, I knew it, you're Frieza's brother after all. And then the enemy appears behind the Saiyan, cursing him angrily, complaining about Vegeta almost killing him, and then showing another form the golden form. Cooler claims he won't forgive him. Looks like Vegeta is going to have a lot, a lot of trouble in this fight. Frieza's spaceship floats through space, and above it are two people facing each other, Frieza and Pycon. The leader of the Celestial Guardians gives his final warning. Pycon says, Frieza, it's the last time I ask. Give me Janemba, or I'll have to use force. But the Emperor of the Universe doesn't like how the Guardian talks, and in a bad mood he says, You bastard, you talk to me like you could defeat me in a snap! But their argument is briefly interrupted when they both feel something that leaves them a little surprised. Pycon thinks to himself, That seems to be the energy of that man named Cooler. His power increased tremendously in an instant. Frieza is also immersed in reflections about that. So, Cooler finally used the golden form. I thought he would hide it longer, but apparently he had no choice. His power is immense, but... Frieza smiles and while addressing Pycon, he says, Don't tell me you're surprised by this power. Let me tell you something. It's true that Cooler is very powerful, and his power has increased dramatically since the day I met him. But it wasn't just his power that increased while we were training. Suddenly, Pycon's vision is dazzled by an intense beam of light. And as he sees this, the Celestial Guardian looks surprised. A globe of light surrounds Frieza, and when that globe of light is scattered, the evil Emperor is already in his last form. Golden Frieza, while smiling proud of his own power, asks his opponent, So, what do you think about that? Is much more powerful than my brother, isn't it? After displaying his power, he explains, he doesn't know that I've been able to perceive his power for some time, but I've also increased my strength in that period. I expected to release that amount of power to kill him when he rebelled against me, 
but I didn't expect a wretch like you to show up to get in my way. While observing Frieza's power, PyCon reflects. Even though he didn't cause any impact waves or anomalies with his transformation, the energy he's emitting is very intense. Releasing this amount of energy without causing any changes to the environment means his control of ki is exceptional. He is indeed very powerful. Frieza interrupts PyCon's musings to say, You know what? It doesn't matter if you were once a god of destruction. I am the great Frieza. I will not cower. On the planet Quinn. The intense fighting continues. Vegeta and Cooler try to hit each other with a large amount of blows, but despite being attacking, Vegeta seems a little cornered. While Cooler seems to handle combat better, which proves to be true when the Golden Warrior starts to advance further against the Blue Warrior, who needs to retreat while trying to defend himself. But Vegeta can no longer maintain his defense, and is hit by a strong attack from Cooler that makes him fall from the sky and have a violent shock to the planet's ground. After doing so, Cooler lands on the ground to face his opponent. The Golden Warrior says, I have to admit, that power you used earlier was scary and even scared me. But now that I'm in this form, I'm sure my powers far surpass your powers. Give up at once and accept your death. This fight is over. Hearing his opponent's words, Vegeta is forced to agree. And as he closes his eyes, he thinks, he's not wrong. If it continues like this, I don't have the slightest chance of winning. In this case, Vegeta surprises him by opening his eyes, and at the same time opening a big confident smile. And while doing so, he says, You found that technique terrifying, did you? So what will you think when you see this? Vegeta begins to concentrate a strange energy. This immediately worries Cooler, who with a fearful expression asks what's going on. That strange purple energy surrounds Vegeta's body, hiding the Saiyan in a midst of power. And then that energy is dispersed. Vegeta shows off his new transformation. With a proud and wild smile on his face, the Prince of Saiyan says, Behold now my most powerful form, the Ultra Ego. 